Well, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining the, um, sorry, I just changed my screen. Thanks for joining the, the Community Energy Pathways, um, uh, our masterclass for Surrey. Um, over the last three or four months, we've been sending out questionnaires and talking to organizations and groups across Surrey and um, we're delighted to welcome you all here today um, on the day that the energy strategy has been launched. You know, it's been a big week for energy and everything that's going on. And um, the energy world is, is an interesting place to be in and resilient communities need to be at the heart of that. And that's really important for all of us. And, um, and we're really grateful for all of your time taking to attend today and, and listening to all the speakers. So I'll, I'll just give you a little introduction, if that's okay, to Community Energy South and what we do and, and why we're here working with Surrey County Council and Green Futures team. And, and um, also I run through the agenda. So we all know what's going on for the next three or four hours and, um, and introduce some of the speakers. So without further ado, so a little bit about Community Energy Pathways and Community Energy South. Um, Community Energy South was set up in 2013, um, following a, a year's programme of mentoring for 12 new community energy groups. So we're based down in, in Lewis, in East Sussex, and there's a community energy group here called Avesco, who, who um, works with Lewis District Council and in the Lewis area. And what was happening was that the phone was ringing all the time from other community energy groups wanting to share the Avesco model and the community energy model. And um, so we established a, a year's training program, a mentoring program with 12 community energy groups, which included the likes of Besco, Brighton Hove Energy Services Cooperative in Brighton, Forest Row Energy, which um, some of you will meet Esme during the day, and that's where she's from, Brighton Energy Co-op, um, Repower Bulkham, which was a community energy group that started out on the back of the fracking issues in Bulkham, um, Cookmere Community Solar, that's working now with Network Rail on the Riding Sunbeams project, Hastings, Energised Sussex Coast, who are an excellent group who have defined fuel poverty work and supporting vulnerable people um, in vulnerable areas. And the list goes on. And those 12 groups are still working today and are thriving. They've got nearly 20 megawatts of projects, hundreds of renewable projects, heat and lighting projects, as well as solar and um, as well as reaching about two and a half thousand residents, vulnerable residents a year with their fuel poverty programs. And, and it's that that we're trying to kickstart through the Pathways program with Surrey and support you, the community energy groups um, or, or groups and organizations wanting to get involved with, with energy and then link you together within the network and this masterclass is kind of kicking that off. And we do other regular masterclasses um, where we look at topics like car sharing or solar rooftops and solar farms or and heat projects. So, you know, we have a big program of, of webinars that go through the year. And, and that's really aligned with, with um, Surrey Futures, with the Surrey Greener Future team and everything that's going on. And I know that they have got a busy day and a long day because they're going to be talking tonight with Zero Carbon Guildford over in Guildford. And, and that should be a really interesting session. So um, I'll move on from this, but my slides will be shared afterwards. So a little bit about community energy. Um, I've stolen this idea from Energy Alton, who are a group that have been going for about 10 years, an award-winning group. And they have a powering up and a powering down policy. And it really is, you know, simple to think about. So in powering up, 
they're looking at community renewable energy, solar rooftops, retrofitting, hydro um, batteries, you know, community heat, car sharing, and harness community finance. So they look at methods of, of running share offers for community energy projects and getting local people to invest. And, and that's what happened back in Lewis in 2009, um, when Harvey's Brewery, who have a lot of cooling units in their brewery and have a high energy usage, had a wonderful shared roof um, that could install solar. And, and that share offer was, was launched with about 200 shareholders who all take an ownership of, of that solar scheme. And um, Harvey's Brewery at that time got very low cost solar, um, which is seeing them through for 25 years. So it's, it's a great scheme and it gets people involved. And, and on top of that, the brewery launched a sunshine um, beer and um, at the share offer day. So that that's, gives you an essence of the type of projects there are in a community. Now, powering down, we look at energy awareness, fuel poverty, home energy visits, and impartial advice. So in our Pathways programme, we look to encourage energy champions to work in communities and be trusted local energy advice. And that's something um, we can work with groups to do in Surrey as we, we evolve the programme. Um, so the agenda today, just so that you're um, aware of it, um, we're going to go on to 11 o'clock with a number of speakers. Um, I'm going to pass over to Melania in a moment from the Sorry Climate Change Strategy um, from the Green Futures team. And also, um, and John Taylor's speaking from the Regional Energy Hub. So we can find out what's going on in Surrey at the moment, what's going on in the region. And, um, and then I'm going to pass over to Esme, who's our project director at Community Energy South and leads this program on partnerships and collaboration and how to start a project off, which will be really useful. And then Nicola, um, who's one of our mentors and also from Made Energy in Maidenhead, um, is looking, we'll also provide a session on um, the impact tool and understanding Clark emissions within a community. Um, and then we're gone after our break, we've got the wonderful Alison Zaraki um, from Sustainable Overton, who's been through this journey. Um, she's now the climate change officer at um, Basingstoke and Dean. So there's lots to learn from Alison, who's been doing this with Overton, started her own community energy team. Um, and also, and then we're here from Nicola again, Nigel Roby from Way Valley Solar Schools, which would be excellent to hear about. It's actually started in Surrey. And then we look at um, district heating with um, Cathy Smythe, which will be really interesting. She's one of the leaders in, in community energy. And, um, and then finish off before lunch with Nikki Myers, who is um, working in communities and leads a project called Community Heat. Um, which is a net zero village project. So taking a project, project a whole rural village to net zero. Um, and then after lunch, uh, we've got Patrick Culligan from Your Fund Surrey. Some of you may be aware of Your Fund Surrey, um, which is an amazing um, fund available in Surrey for community groups. And you can access that from Energy and Patrick will explain. For that so that's a great opportunity and existing fund um, and then we've got breakout schools um, groups to look at schools churches heat village halls and energy saving and to get us all speaking before we we close um, and just before i pass on to melania our partnerships are really important within the community energy sector over the past 10 years um, we've worked closely with Bayes, the Regional Energy Hub, and Community Energy England and other counties across the southeast to build a, a, a support mechanism for community energy. And, um, and we're seeing that weekly with communities wanting to discuss climate action and energy and how they can get involved 
and become resilient. So we're very honoured to be in this space and supporting community energy groups and communities to do that. And please reach out for us and, and enjoy the journey. Um, also on our website, you can join and we have a weekly, a monthly newsletter and, and you can link into all of our webinars. So without further ado, Liz, I will pass on to Melania. Thank you. Thank you, Ollie. Well, Melania, oh, she's ready. Melania, we can still, we can see your slide, your side slides. Um, also, just while we're waiting for Melania to start, uh, we do encourage people to put lots of questions in the chat box. Uh, you'll find people are very helpful in these sessions and, and you'll get lots of answers, both from the speakers and within the chat. Perfect. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, so my name is Melania Tarquino. I'm the Strategic Energy Program Manager for Surrey County Council in the Greener Futures team. Um, I'm going to present you the climate change delivery plan and some of the work that, that we have been doing on, on energy and, and other aspects. And first of all, I want to say how excited we are uh, to be working in the pathways. Um, a year ago, more or less, we started discussing with our district and boroughs and, and other colleagues at, at the county what could we do to start encouraging more the community energy groups and luckily we came across Community Energy South, which offered exactly what we were looking for. And it's really exciting to see so much interest already in the very early stages of this pathway. And yeah, we will do all what we can from our side to, to support these groups. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for having me here. This is- Melania, are you able to turn yourself up a little bit? Because you're quite quiet. <laughs> yeah, I'm having some microphone sorry you'll have to see my face much closer than you would like to but that's the only way can you hear me better now i can hear you loud and clear okay <laughs> okay sorry um okay so just to start with the uh, picture of the carbon emissions in surrey and uh, this is for 2018 we had 1.5 of the uk total annual emissions and the majority as you can see 37% comes from transport, road transport. Just to give you an idea, sorry, has a above national average car ownership uh, and is one of the top five counties for traffic. So that's an area where we have to do lots of work, but also on um, gas and electricity for residential and non-residential properties. Those are the, the higher emitter sectors. And we emitted 6.6 .6 million tons of CO2 in, in 2018. Uh, and in terms of the emissions generated from all the local uh, authorities in Surrey, so Surrey County Council and the district and boroughs, it makes up less than 1% of the total emissions in Surrey, uh, but it's still, of course, uh, what we can directly influence. So it's where we are working really hard to-, to Lani, yeah. your slides aren't moving. What do you see now? Just your first one still. It's moving here. Can you see it there? Yeah, that's working for you. That's great. Okay, I'm, I'm going to just that's, make it big. That's on the second slide. Yeah. Sorry, okay. no, I don't know what happened. Let's well, have it there. Yeah. It's not on full screen though, so we still yeah, got the sort of page background. Yeah. Do you see it there? Yeah, full screen. Do you want to just move move them on when you're ready or? Can you see emissions in all Surrey authorities? Uh, yeah, that's exactly the slide that I can see now. Is it moved now? Is it moving? Let's have a look. Um, okay. Okay. I'm oh, Mark Loder has suggested go to slideshow. Sorry, it doesn't show. Show. Let me let me show them like this if it's okay because I I don't think it's working in slideshow. Hopefully you can see it like this. Melania, I can see your third slide now very clearly. Okay, perfect. So yeah, I was talking about the emissions in, in sorry. 
so yeah, this is Melania. Are you, uh, how are you getting on? Can you hear me? Sorry. Hello. <laughs> we can't hear you either, Melania. Oh, oh, I don't know what. No, we, we can hear you, Melania. I'm confused. Can you hear me or not? Yes. I can. Okay. Melania, it's Verena. I can hear you, but your okay. um, slides yeah. are very small. Yes, it, for some reason it's not working in the slideshow. Uh, I hope you can see like this. Can you put it on to um, the slideshow um, icon, bottom right? Yeah, I did that, but... Uh, uh, okay. Nothing. It's All right then. But I, yeah, I can hear you. I just like to about anybody else. Sir. Can you yeah, come? Are you button? able to just move on to your next slide now? Okay. Uh, sorry for that. So, yeah, that's good. Perfect. So yeah, just saying here that we are working hard to decarbonize the electricity and heating in our buildings as well, in, in the buildings owned by the local authorities in Surrey. So to give an idea of the scale of the challenge, and uh, we always talk about what we need to achieve by 2050 or 2030, but 2025, for example, is now in, in just three years, and we need to reduce between 20 to 40 percent uh, of the carbon emissions compared to the 2018 levels. Achieving a 20% reduction is already uh, in, in a five year period is super challenging and requires different levels of policy and funding that, that have, we have not in place currently. But achieving a 40% is, is very, is, it will be necessary, but it's almost impossible unless very fundamental changes occur in the national policy and funding levels. So this is a, a bit of the, pathway that we will want to follow to achieve uh, our target by 2050 or net zero target by 2050. Um, but you can see by 2025 what we will need to achieve yeah, and the extent of the challenge is for 53,000 homes with low carbon heating or uh, 7,800 businesses with low carbon heating and 6.2 million additional solar panels, etc. So uh, we developed last year the climate change, the, well, in, in the last couple of years, the climate change delivery plan. Um, so this is in response to Surrey County Council and other local authorities declaring the climate emergency and which set up this net zero target by 2050. And the delivery plan sets up what has to happen over the next five years. Uh, this is the first step in a 30 year long delivery phase. So we will be updating it every five years. And the climate change delivery plan identified 70 actions building on the, on the action that was already being done by sorry, local authorities. And the key in all of these actions, I will take you through some of these, but the key is that none of us can do this alone. This requires a partnership work and collabor collaborative work with residents, businesses and academia. And of course I added there the community energy groups um, so in terms of the delivery plan, we had um, created four key programs uh, to, to uh, and in, in those programs, we have split the, the 70 actions that we identified. So you can see the greener futures communities is 97% of the carbon emissions. So that's the biggest challenge is for us to achieve this behavior change and support the communities to, to, to change to more sustainable ways of living. But we have different tools and, and projects and programs to, to support this. And this is community energy pathways is one of those. Um, then the One Net Zero Public State uh, program, which includes all the public sector partners and, and local authorities, and that's at 2% of the carbon emissions. Uh, the Build Back Greener and Grow Back Greener, I will briefly mention those at the end as well. So in terms of the Greener Futures community, sorry if you see it's very small here, but I will share the slides after. Uh, I will focus mainly on this program, Greener Futures Community, which aims at empowering individuals, businesses and communities to make reductions in, in their own homes, communities and workplaces. Um, 
So some of the programs and priorities we have for 2025 is supporting elderly residents, low income and off gas households mainly, uh, and all uh, yeah, vulnerable households to reduce the bills uh, and decarbonize. We have already accessed funding from the Green Homes Grant, uh, the local authority delivery program, phase one, two, and phase three, that is the sustainable warm. In total, the funding that we have uh, managed through, sorry, is 27.6 million. So we have already helped decarbonizing lots of households, but there is much more to, to happen in the next couple of years. Um, and this is to increase energy efficiency of these low income households. And um, we also uh, want to accelerate the uptake of solar panels in uh, for residents to around 10% of the residential homes through the solar together scheme. We had this scheme um, starting last year and is uh, finalizing now in the next couple of months and it has been really successful. We have more than seven, um, uh, 7,000 registrations, around um, 1,500 residents accepted the solar quotes or battery retrofit quotes. And when the installations are finished in, in August, we will have 5.4 megawatts of capacity being generated with those solar panels. So that's already a massive scale for being the first round of this program. And we are going to continue in some way with some sort of collective uh, purchase scheme for solar uh, in Surrey in the, in the next, in this year and the next years to come. Um, and yeah, other things that we are doing is, for example, encouraging the um, private rented sector to, to uh, apply the minimum energy efficiency standards and thinking of developing a sort of loan scheme for low carbon improvements in the next years and supporting uh, the Surrey local transport plan as well. So moving to businesses, uh, we, we can support businesses to set ambitious climate reduction targets and offer low carbon goods and services to residents. So there we have the low case grant uh, that offers funding up to 10,000 pounds for small and medium sized enterprises so they can improve their green credentials. Um, and uh, yeah, this is already a very successful program that is ongoing at the moment. Um, it might apply for some community energy projects uh, potentially. So that's something to consider and, and something that will be uh, yeah, being discussed over the, the pathways as well. And supporting the creation of job opportunities and, and transfer job transfers to the green skill market through the for example, a like Green Skills Academy. So that's a project that we are working on, trying to um, planning how to uh, train an, a, a gas boilers engineers, for example, to, to be heat pump installers. And well, the key point is obviously here communities. Um, we are really delighted to be working on these community energy pathways to provide the skills that uh, and, and the support that will be needed to undertake this project and um, your fan sorry that i will just briefly talk about it and my colleague will join later to to discuss that as well and supporting the creation of uh, local and sustainable options to travel work and buy services and um, so just to give you an idea of the extent that we need uh, to work on sorry needs to contribute to the grid decarbonization by increasing the capacity of renewable energy by 1,244 megawatts of, of low carbon energy. And well, yeah, I mentioned before the 6.2 million solar panels and other forms of renewable energy. So uh, your fun, sorry, I'm not gonna make much focus here because uh, we have a colleague joining later to, to talk about it, but it's, it's really a key program that uh, that could apply for some of the community energy projects that might arise from this pathway. And it's a 100 million pounds um, fund offered by Surrey County Council for community projects and to cover capital costs uh, that for projects that will support and improve the lives in the local communities. Um, so yeah, I, I left the link there for, for more information and 
and then you can ask all the specific questions on that program to, to my colleagues. Mm. So for the, the other program, the one that zero public state, which is to support local authorities um, and of course ourselves <laughs> to reduce carbon emissions in our own buildings and vehicles and supply change, uh, chains. So we are working towards the 2030 net zero target in Surrey County Council uh, and uh, by achieving a 40% emission reduction in, in our buildings and vehicles by 2025. And that's a massive challenge for ourselves because we have around 600 buildings to decarbonize in, in a very short time frame. Um, decarbonization as well of schools and other public sector buildings and working supporting the NHS, police and other or collaborating with other public sector bodies uh, to, to work on this. And of course, maximize, maximizing the renewable energy generation and especially solar power in our public lands. And we have uh, identified a big, big uh, capacity of around more than 360 megawatt uh, capacity in our lands available. Um, for solar development. So that's something that we are currently working on and we are very keen to collaborate with community energy groups and potentially uh, yeah, analyze the possibility to, to develop some of these sites with uh, or, or let these sites to be developed by community energy groups in the future. Um, and the same way, if we can find ways of getting community energy groups to, to support us in, the, in our and the decarbonization of our buildings that will be also something that will be a win-win for both parts um, and well the other two are more on in terms of uh, sustainable procurement practices and, and and sustainable travel for our staff mm -hmm. um the last two slides then uh, the other program is build back greener which is more focused on the planning decisions and designing uh, and regeneration projects with uh, a zero carbon future in, in, in mind. Um, so designing, for example, with uh, bearing in mind the adaptation to the impacts of climate change as well. So we're working on the Surrey infrastructure plan and, and low carbon planning decisions that, that follow uh, mm. zero carbon <laughs> targets developing a story-wide transport network that prioritizes walking and cycling and public transport, as well as electric vehicle charging, um, supporting the transformation of a low carbon energy system by considering the potential for solar panels and heat networks. So we have been starting to do some work as well to identify potential heat network opportunities in Surrey, and we, we intend to continue developing those further. That's as well maybe a potential opportunity to, to work in collaboration with community energy groups. And well, as well, um, having a resilience plan and climate, uh, climate change adaptation plan and adapting the flood management strategy uh, as well to, to the climate change impact. And the final program is the Grow Back Greener, which uh, aims at managing the woodland, green spaces, and farmland to maximize the ability to absorb carbon uh, from the atmosphere and grow food sustainably and improve the habitats needed for wildlife, wildlife to thrive. So we are working on the land management fram framework and uh, also planting around 600,000 trees uh, um, and yeah, bringing the woodland back into good management. Um, so yeah, it's just a quick uh, overview of the climate change delivery plan, but you can find more information in, in that link in the website. Um, if you have any questions as well, you can send us an email. Um, yeah, and I will be here for to reply to any questions. But again, I wish you a very successful session and I'm delighted to see so many people here today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Melania. That was a very encouraging and interesting uh, presentation. There's quite a few questions in the chat. 
Um, so if there's anybody from Surrey County Council able to answer those, that would be great. I think a couple of the questions will be answered probably a bit later um, by some of the future presentations. I would, um, I'm going to hand over to John now from, uh, it, are you the, well, he'll tell you, Net Zero Hub, Energy Hub, they've renamed. So let me hand over to John. All right, thank you very much, Liz. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep, so good. Um, yeah, so literally, um, this is the last presentation I'll be giving us the Greater Southeast Energy Hub, because um, as of today, we're rebranding as the Greater Southeast Net Zero Hub. Um, so that's a um, very welcome move to um, a little bit of a background about who we are. <clears throat> Excuse me, just... There we go. So um, yeah, we're a team funded by Bayes um, and our role is to be an extra resource for local authorities and community groups to draw on to accelerate the delivery of um, net zero projects out in the regions. Um, so I personally work down um, in East and West Sussex and Surrey um, is my area. And um, yeah, you can see we provide resources and support for local authorities and um, we also deliver several um, funding programmes for Bays, including the Green Homes Grant Energy Efficiency Scheme and the Rural Community Energy Fund, which is very relevant for today's session. Um, so the Rural Community Energy Fund, um, it finished actually in February 2022, but through that we supported 54 projects across the region um, with feasibility study and development grants. So groups very much like yourselves, volunteers wanting to do more on climate change and renewable energy. Um, and um, this, the aim of this was to help you buy in the expertise needed to deliver your projects. Um, um, so yeah, it could be um, help getting technical support, legal support, things like that. To, um, yeah, fill in the skills gaps within your groups. Um, when we agreed to do this talk, we were hoping we would have um, a new funding announcement to what will follow on from the Rural Community Energy Fund. Um, nationally, the, it's all been delivered successfully, so I think, and public interest in this sort of approach has never been higher. So I think we've demonstrated the demand is there for something to um, continue. Um, but as soon as we hear whether we've got the resource within the Net Zero Hub, we'll certainly communicate that out through Community Energy South. Um, we're officially going to be supporting community energy pathways grow um, throughout the next financial year. And we also work closely with Community Energy England, um, who will be collating a lot of the learnings from the Rural Community Energy Fund programme, um, reviewing all the viable business models and case studies. And there will also be a peer support element as part of that. So successful projects will be able to work um, with you, newer groups coming through um, the pathways programme. Um, some other sources of funding that we're aware of that local authorities like your districts and boroughs and Surrey County Council may be able to access on your behalf um, include the Shared Prosperity Fund, the Leveling Up Funds and Town Deals. We've seen several community energy um, initiatives partner with their local authorities to get their own local funding to um, accelerate delivery um, of their kind of local net zero delivery plans. Um, there are also other social enterprise support organisations like Power to Change, um, the National Lottery and the MCS Charitable Foundation. Um, they're well worth looking into as well. So the sort of um, expertise we've seen groups buy in. Um, so, yeah, I mentioned engineering consultants, the people that can actually explain which sort of renewables are suitable for your particular local geography, whether that's solar farms, wind energy or renewable heating networks. Um, obviously with the larger projects, you need to get them through the planning system. So planning advisors um, are well worth getting some advice on both for um, general approach to the planning system, but also specifically around ecology studies, archeology span surveys, things like that. Um, remember as a community energy group, you will, you are in fact a business. You are gonna be trading um, energy, you'll be having you'll be owning assets, things like that. So there's also the governance side to consider and getting that expertise of how you run a social enterprise and also the contracts you have in place um, and legal agreements, whether it's yeah, leasing land, leasing roof space or having power purchase contracts between different parties. Um, again, part of the planning process and community as a whole is engaging the wider community um, and gaining buy-in for these projects. So. Um, yeah, there are community engagement specialists that can also be brought in to 
um, help you um, yeah, uh, get better engagement for your projects. Um, one network I'm aware of um, where I am in Suffolk, uh, there's an ex um, a network called Suffolk Pro Help, which is um, 40 plus um, businesses based in the county, professional services, um, kind of made up of the above kind of categories who provide free support to the voluntary community sector. So uh, they have an idea there that Surrey could potentially replicate as well. Um, so there's my email address and our website. We'll update that as soon as we have more details. But um, yeah, best of luck and yeah, we'll be in touch. Thank you so much, John. Um, I don't know, uh, I understand you've only got a little bit of time. Do you need to leave straight away? Um, yeah, within the next few minutes, I can't stay until lunch, unfortunately. Uh, okay, in that case, I, um, I propose, if, has anybody got any urgent questions they want to put to John? It doesn't look like there are no raised hands. Um, okay. Yes, yes, sorry. Can I make one point? Um, mm. um, just from a, a kind of regional perspective, the the energy hub that team work that John works in has got what well, you've got about twelve people that work for you, John, that are there as a resource for for the region. And I know a lot of the local authorities work closely with the energy hub, but John John is a great supporter and all of his team of the sector. So if ever you come across any technical blockers or things like that, do reach out to John and his team. They're there to help. And it's been set up by Bayes as a regional support hub. And um, it's great that they're now becoming net zero hub. And, um, and, and that's, that's also important because in setting up the net zero hub and the Greater Southeast Energy Hub, it was embedded in the region's strategy so this is important, you know, so community energy is supported both at a county level and at a regional level. And just wanted to get that across really. So thank you, John. Right. Thanks for that, Ollie. Thank you, John and Ollie. I'm going to hand over to Esme now, who runs our Pathways programme. Morning, everybody. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah, good, and you can hear me fine. I'm gonna go full screen. Hopefully this is gonna work. Um, for some reason, you've got my next slide up as well. We tried to fix that earlier. I'm just going to go rather than mess around with controls. Um, so, um, yeah, just bear with me. You can see the next screen so you can see what's coming next. And um, so getting a community energy project started. This is what we're all about at Community Energy South. And this is what we are here to help you with through the Pathways programme. So I'm going to run through a few basics. Um, but just bear in mind, um, we have this support available to you to help you start these projects. So um, don't be overwhelmed by anything that I'm going through. So I'm going to look at um, what are your aims of community energy projects, what might be right for your community, um, how you can start doing an initial assessment on projects. And then I'm gonna to touch on incorporating um, your group and the funding and mentoring support that is available to you. So at the outset, I wanted to start a community energy project. Um, there's a range of questions to ask yourselves and your groups that you're working with. Um, so what do you actually want to make happen? So there's lots of different options that are available. So for community energy projects, they are essentially energy projects that are led by people in your community. As may, as yeah. may, I'm sorry to interrupt you. It must be a glitch today on... on Is it not Zoom. moving forward? Yeah, it's not moving forward. It's the same as Melania. It's oh, OK. It's funny how this has happened. Can you see yeah. this now? I can say I can know. Ah, yeah. Now so, you... I've been, so I've taken your presentation mode. Yeah. And can you see it now? Yes. Next one. So I'm going to just flick through it this way. OK, what do you want to make happen? Yeah. So I so yeah, but it's it's not in presentation mode, but you can see the slides. So that's that's all fine. So what do you want to make happen? So first of all, community energy projects. They're simply energy projects that are led by people in your community, and they could be a whole range of different projects. They could be renewable energy projects. They could be energy efficiency projects, retrofit projects. They could be fuel poverty projects. Of course, we're 
massive energy bill increases at the moment. It's going to be really important in your local community that people can save energy and cut their energy bills as well. So there's a lot of work done in fuel poverty with community energy. So community energy companies, um, you could be thinking of starting up a community energy company, you could already be part of one. Um, you may have a charity or a more of an informal group that you're linked with or maybe looking to join with. Uh, they can be all sorts of shapes and sizes. Many community owned uh, community energy companies own renewable energy installations and many don't at all. Many run projects funded by grants and they may also offer consultancy in their local community. So there's all sorts of shapes and sizes. So at the start, think about what you want to make happen. And I would say aim small to start with. And then have a think about what's right for your community. So you could start to undertake a mapping exercise. First of all, it's important to look at where all your high energy users in your local community. So these are the, these are the organizations and the businesses that uh, going to be easiest to work with in terms of supplying renewable energy because they have a high energy consumption. So, for example, a railway um, or a, a large factory or anything that's going to have a high energy use, a school as well. Um, and what are your high profile energy users? So you want to target your high energy users, but also who's high profile in your local community. So um, when we did our first project in Forest Road, we had uh, solar panels installed on our, our parish council, village hall. They were in the centre of the village. Very well known. It's good to get the momentum started and good to get yourself known by doing a high profile project. Think about whether you're looking to do things in rural or urban areas. So this can really define what type of projects and the logistics around them, uh, whether you're gonna be more sparsely uh, populated, whether you may have be using heating oil, uh, just think of the context in which your project is in. Um, and also you may want to run a fuel poverty project and energy advice. You don't have to start looking at renewable energy and energy efficiency, if that seems like too big to start. Start small, offer some energy advice in your local community and we can support you with all of these. So think about um, what support is available in your local community? What's already happening? What partnerships can you establish? So there is invariably going to be things happening in your community already, maybe in schools, churches, village halls, parish councils, uh, residence groups may be interested. Um, you may have energy mentioned in your neighbourhood plan, which is, if you have, that's fantastic to create some leverage there. So at the outset, we recommend doing a little bit of scoping in your local community, getting in touch with people that are already working in this area. And then when you look to go forward, have a think about any planning issues that you may encounter. Um, so of course, Surrey, you have the Surrey Hills, AOMB, so in those areas, it's gonna, you're going to need to take a slightly different approach if you're looking to develop renewable energy. Um, it, it's all navigable, um, but there's issues you need to take into account. And most importantly, you need an engaged site owner. Um, it sounds like a basic thing to say, um, but that is often where the greater amount of work is, getting a, a site that is interested, engaged, and that you can sell the concept of community energy to. What type of project you want to do? So a whole range of different renewable energy projects. Um, also here, not mentioned on this diagram, uh, retrofit projects and energy efficiency projects. So starting out, you're probably going to want to think about electric cars, EV charging. You're going to want to think about uh, solar PV and heat pumps as well. Uh, wind turbines, still the planning system in the UK, uh, we, with the new energy strategy, this, there may be some changes, but onshore wind turbines are a bit tricky still, uh, especially in protected areas, uh, you probably would not want to start there. Microgrid, especially if you've got new housing developments, but also uh, looking at uh, new business models to share energy. Uh, hydrogen and micro hydro, hydro uh, hydrogen is, it is still very much at the outset, micro hydro, uh, there is lots of examples with community energy, but it's not the kind of starter projects. So these are the kind of projects that we can help you look at and start to scope out. And 
what I've got here next, lots of words, I know, but this is essentially a checklist to do a bit of an assessment of your project pipeline. Um, you don't need to be a mechanical engineer or a expert to start some initial assessment of your project pipeline. So these are the kind of questions that we recommend that you run through. So first of all, the site, have you got the site identified? engaged site owner really important and who will be the energy off taker so so lots of people say oh let's get a let's get a soda farm near our village we can supply uh we can supply the village with it for example but how 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 will that energy off taker actually work so essentially you need a high energy user near a site itself so if you've just got a field in the middle of nowhere who is that energy off taker going to be? It can go into the grid and that can work financially, um, but that's a bit more tricky. So ideally you can supply directly. Um, what is the scale of the project? And is it appropriate to your organization? Uh, a, a rooftop solar is going to be more achievable at the outset than a big solar farm, for example. Are you looking to supply energy to an organization? Ask them for their energy bills. Um, also ask them if they may have any half hourly data because that can allow you to see what the energy profile of the site is. So ideally you have a good amount of daytime energy use and it's, um, it's consistent throughout the year. Um, so some of the tricky things, for example, schools, uh, if you're looking to install solar, they're away on holiday throughout the summer when most of your um, electricity is going to be generated. So things to look out for. How much are they paying on their energy costs? Kind of things you want to ask. How energy efficient are your buildings? So at the outset, you want to make sure that the buildings are as energy efficient as possible. That's where to start. It's all very well installing lots of technologies, but if you're wasting energy, that is a waste of time also at the outset. So make the buildings energy efficient first. Um, and then there's a whole range of other questions there. I'm not going to run through them all because I know we're pushed for time. Um, but these are all the kind of things that we will run through um, with the groups and with the projects that we're supporting. And we'll start to build a project pipeline with you and help you make a start on them. So just clicking onto a few more slides. Um, funding and support. So at the outset, with our support that we offer, we offer startup support. We're offering this in Surrey. Um, this is something that not all areas have. So we're really happy to offer it to you in Surrey. Please do make use of us. Um, we've got a great team, fantastic resource to help you with community energy projects. And there's a whole wide range of ways you can start to get um, income into uh, your projects, into your community energy groups. Some groups um, charge a membership income. There are lots of grants out there. So we are building a database. We have built a database of all the funds in Surrey that you can potentially apply to, to get project funding. And we can support you on those funding bids. You may get consultancy income once you start up a project, you can help um, others in your community. And then of course, income from energy generation as well later on um, in the process. Once you've started looking at the project, um, in order to secure funds into your project, you will need to be incorporated in some capacity. And this could be a community energy at community benefit society. It could be a cooperative. Um, there's also other structures like community interest companies and charities. So we can help you navigate all of the incorporation process if you're not already incorporated or help you access the funds that are available through your um, incorporation structure. We recommend at the outset building a business plan and we've got an entire webinar on this on our YouTube channel. So do have a look at that. These are some initial questions that to ask yourself in building a business plan for your community energy project, because it's, obviously very important that this stacks up financially and it's a long-term financially sustainable project. So if you're thinking of doing community energy, just start out by answering these kind of questions. What's your vision? What do you want to make happen? What steps do you need to take? Who are the people that need to be involved? Don't go it alone. This is not a kind of exercise that you want to be on your own with. Start to build a team. Um, and then start to assess, do an initial, initial assessment on projects to see what your priorities are as well. 
So a whole wide range of questions and we can support you with business plans. And as I said, yeah, don't go it alone. Um, you, you need to have a team with you when you build community energy projects. Uh, as, as a basic, you need a project manager or someone who is uh, able to manage your projects. And ideally they have some experience in energy, uh, in the energy industry, but also as well, um, if, we're, if we're working with you in Surrey, we can bring all of this into your group. So if you have absolutely no experience whatsoever, don't be put off, we can help you. Um, you need a chairperson or someone that can facilitate a group. And this person might think about governance as well. Somebody who can do some outreach and someone who you can do your admin. So this is your core group or core functions. You might have one person doing two of these. And just finally, just to obviously say again, we're here to support you. Uh, this is the support we're offering. We've got the Community Energy Masterclass, this that you're at today. Great to see so many people here. We have a guide that is gonna be available to you shortly about how to start a community energy project and also a funding guide. So all the funds that you could potentially apply to. We have First Steps Business Support. This is available now and we can offer this up to 10 groups. And um, please let us know if you're interested. We can run through all the kind of things that I've already covered in this presentation and many of the things you'll see today and help you just to see whether this is right for you as a community energy project. You don't need to commit at this stage to doing anything, um, but this is to assess and to, to find out what first steps you want to take. And then um, we have five places for next steps business support following that. So this is when we're going to go into real detail with the groups in Surrey, help you build a business plan, work on you with funding bids and essentially get your community energy business up and running. You will get a mentor that works with you and you will get access to an entire team of people that have done all these projects before. Um, so please let us know. And I know that's very brief. I hope that's given you a summary of the kind of things that we do. Keep in touch and hope you enjoy the rest of the morning. Thank you so much, Esme. That was, uh, that was really good. There are some questions coming up in the chat box that I'll hand over to you um, while we also open up to Nicola, who is going to show us one of my favorite tools. And Jess is gonna put a link in the chat box to the tool so you can play along, I think. Brilliant, thank you, Liz. Morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and I can get started. Brilliant. Hopefully you can see that all right. I'm talking about the Impact Community Carbon Calculator tool this morning. It's a digital visualization tool. It's a brilliant tool that helps you understand your community's carbon footprint. It works for parishes, wards, and local authority areas. And it helps to identify the areas where taking action to tackle climate change can make the biggest difference. It really is a brilliant tool. It's created by the Center for Sustainable Energy, Exeter University, Bayes, and the Research Councils. And it's a really useful place to start if you're looking to create a community energy project and you'd like it to be driven by data. For example, a community-wide domestic energy saving project, a village scale low carbon heating project, solar or heat generation for local industrial buildings. Hopefully that will move on. My screen isn't, my slides are not moving on. There we go. The way the data is presented is in two forms, really, territorial data versus consumption data. And it's really important that I explain this to you. It's two approaches to carbon footprinting. When you go into it and you put your village in, you can choose territorial or consumption. A territorial shows the emissions produced within an area, and it's based on what happens in that space. For example, transport systems, farming, manufacturing, and that's regardless of whether local people there use those products, products or services. It's really useful because it cuts up national or regional data sets and assigns them per household. And the consumption side tells, shows you emissions produced as a result of what the people there within the area use daily. 
Both comparisons are really useful in deciding which issue you'd like to tackle. For example, supporting households to save energy or working to minimize a particular source emission. And it's also a useful source of evidence when creating a marketing campaign, business case for your new project, for example. The territorial one, it tells you who you might like to lobby or work with. The consumption one shows the changes that you might like to make at an individual level. The next slides from here are screenshots I've taken from the website for exploring the tool using different parishes in Surrey. Okay, there's a lot of data on here. You don't need to look through it in, in great detail. You can do that yourself when you play it about. Here, I've got two random villages, chosen at random. You choose your areas, then click between consumption and territorial at the top. The perspectives can produce very different results. Here, we've got two Surrey parishes chosen at random to show variation at the consumption level. You can see I've got consumption highlighted. Um, or you can compare, rather than two villages, you can compare one against the national figures. Now this village comparison shows the one on the left has double the carbon emissions from the use of energy in homes, which is the red section, compared to the village on the right. Perhaps this indicates the village is off gas, the, ho the houses might be bigger, perhaps the houses there have um, a greater proportion of solid walls, they've got lower energy um, retention, possibly not factors within easy control of the good people living in the parish on the left. Now, dwelling and level emissions have been estimated based on data sources such as Experian, um, energy performance certificate data, etc. And it's been aggregated to parish level. I'll tell you the next slide. Same two villages I've got here, but here we're looking at the territorial data, which is useful because as the village on the left shows, there's a much higher emission from road transport showing perhaps a busy road in the area and more industrial stroke commercial levels and agriculture. And it can be really useful to delve into why. Remember, these figures might suggest that there are people that you in your village, your community, you could lobby, with, lobby to or work with to achieve a reduction in carbon. So it's really useful to look at comparison between consumption and territorial to present the opportunities that might be available to you in your group. Now here I've got, let me just check, consumption comparison. I've got a random parish versus the national average. This slide indicates consumption data of a diff different parish with emissions approximately double that of the national data in all sections. That can indicate larger houses, greater wealth, for example, so potentially a greater opportunity for change. Moving on, household energy consumption example. Here I've picked um, a, a village and I've picked here, you can see the red 6.4 tons of carbon per annum. So this is a different parish again, where I've selected consumption data. You see that the housing emissions, they aren't particularly notable for a, a village, a house in a village in Surrey, but this parish happens to include a small settlement not connected to the gas grid, which I discovered by checking a different data set on the next slide. So I had to play around to see which ones, which village might, um, which parish might be a good example. And this next slide is really interesting if you remember the data on this slide. This is a great free data set called Non-Gas Map, and it shows the proportion of homes not using gas, that's the extent of fuel poverty and deprivation. And Nikki at Vesco is going to talk to you about this in more detail. So parishes of this particular village size, and it was a parish called um, Headley. And this is a, about a village which mostly relies on electricity, wood or oil for heating. So it might be ideal for a low carbon heat project, like the community heat project that Nikki will explain. So this is um, about a village scale retrofit for energy saving. So I thought it was a really good comparison of using the two, two tools together. Last slide. Here I've taken a village in Hampshire, which I know has a few sizable industrial operations present. 
These guys are doing brilliant work, a uh, parish um, called Overton in Basingstoke and Dean. So I've taken this because this is another example of using the impact tool with a territorial layer on it to spot community energy opportunities linked with local industry. So rather than households, the grey is showing an opportunity there. So you and your group, you could try looking for opportunities for community owned carbon, um, low carbon uh, initiatives like heat or solar with the commercial entity as the consumer customer for your project. So you create the, the project and they draw down and pay you for the energy you generate. So you can spend some time looking through this impact tool, watching their short YouTube tutorials. Um, we're fortunate to have um, we, um, a presentation from this time last year from CSE to fully explain the tool. So it's worth looking back on the YouTube videos to see in more detail uh, an expert perspective. But I thought I'd bring you this perspective um, from an energy from a community energy group. Um, you can see that from that video, two hours, 15 minutes in, it's really useful. And that's that. I hope it's useful. Thank you, Liz. Thank you so much, Nicola. I just find that so, so it's such an interesting and valuable tool. And also, I have to say, well done to all the speakers for getting us back on track for the tea break. Absolutely genius for all of you, because there was a while where we were slipping behind about 20 minutes. So uh, really well done. Um, and yeah, I just thought those were really inspiring presentations. So thank you very much. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a half hour tea break now. Uh, so, you know, do go and get yourself a cup of tea and join back, uh, uh, join us at half 11. Some of us, I imagine, will still, still be sitting here. So, uh, you know, you might want to come and chat to Nicola about the tool or if Esme is still here, which she is, you could come and chat to Esme. Um, and yeah, and uh, see you see you all at half eleven. Thank you very much. And I'm going to start talking now. Yes, I agree, Christopher. It is a, that tool is absolutely just genius. And I thought how Nicola put it together with uh, how to use the tool and how to use it for lobbying is. I mean, I'm just really good, Nicola. Thank you so much. It's very inspiring. It was very clever, Nicola. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be ready to kick off. Okay, so and there have been a few moments this morning where people, oh, perfect. Right, but I suggest we wait till 11.30 on the dot so people don't feel hard done by if they join at 11.30. I'm guessing you're unmuted, but I can't tell. I am unmuted, yes. And it's 11.30, so I'm handing over Hooray. to Alison from <laughs> Excellent. Sustainable Overton. Thank you, Liz. So I'm Alison Zarecki. I am a director at Test Source Community Energy. Um, so what I'm going to do today in, I think I have 15 minutes, do I? I'm going to take you through our journey from our inception at year zero until now, which is where we have a share offer. Poised, ready to go, but I have to say, sadly, nothing is signed yet. So um, I was hoping to have better news, but fingers crossed soon. Right, hold on, how do I do my next slide? Ah, oh, I can't get it to move. Sorry, I'm more used to Teams than uh, Zoom. Can you press enter? Ah, there we go. So that's, that's us, uh, minus two directors. So we have 10 directors um, and we're, we're lucky to have found a, a really good um, uh, people who've got some great background, which I'll go into in just a moment. Um, so the first thing was, obviously, you need to build your team. Um, so our team grew out of our, we have a climate change group called Sustainable Overton, and the energy group from that, it started off with three people, um, but we recruited more, and we found that uh, having a stall in our village centre was really useful. We put up a stall with lots of information about community energy, and we've found people who are accountants, who work in renewables, heat pumps, solar, um, Southern Gas Networks. So we've we've put together, a, I think, a really strong team. So I think uh, recruitment is obviously very important. Um, the second thing is obviously you need to decide your vision. Uh, and we had a twofold vision. So the first one was obviously we want to decarbonize the parish. We had an ambitious target of carbon zero by 2030. And um, so we need to increase renewable energy. And the second was 
to help residents to be more energy efficient, insulate their houses, conserve energy. That's obviously particularly pertinent at the moment uh, with the energy crisis. So for that, we actually have some energy champions, uh, which I'm not talking about this time, but um, uh, that's something which you can have a look at on our website if you're interested. So um, next thing obviously is to identify your sites. Um, so we we looked through the entire parish uh, looking for sites that are now going to be suitable for a post fit model, um, if that makes sense. So the fit being the feed in tariff. Um, and now that there is no feed in tariff, you need a, a big site with a good roof with a really high energy usage. Um, and it's quite hard to find this, actually, because you get you know, you can get great roofs, hardly any usage, big usage, terrible roof. So we were trying to marry up those two sites using something called sleeving, uh, which we're still trying to do, but we're finding that's quite problematic because of the cost. Um, people need to pay a little bit of a premium, which is not very, uh, uh, very popular. So we, we did a massive education process. I mean, when I started this, if it makes you feel better, I knew virtually nothing about energy. So I've been on a massively steep learning curve. So I just attended everything I could, these sorts of master classes, um, lots of online resources, lots of local experts, um, and also our consultants who were, they're called Renew EV, they're based in Chippenham, um, have really been helpful, you know, going around to sites, looking at the types of roof, um, looking at the electricity bills to see if they're going to be suitable and, you know, trying to build that into a, a financial model to look at, you know, is this actually going to be a player or not? Uh, we also had a really brilliant uh, person that was very good with something called Parish Online, if you're familiar with that. So he had two screens, Parish Online on one, Google Maps on the other, and he found that very easy to then try and identify potential sites um, to make a little short list. So really what you're looking for is a site that's going to use at least 70% ideally of the energy themselves. So things like, you know, uh, care homes, golf courses, uh, places with big refrigeration, um, any sort of high usage. Um, community engagement is a really big part. Uh, you, as part of our, uh, we applied for an RCEF bid, uh, Rural Community Energy Fund. Um, I think they're doing another round at the moment. Um, you, you need to demonstrate that your community actually supports this concept of community energy. Um, so again, we did our stall in the village again, and uh, we did a questionnaire to ask people about, you know, were they interested in community energy? Did they understand it? You know, would they be interested in investing? Would they support, you know, what kind of energy would they support? Um, and if you want to have a look at, you're very welcome to have a look at ours. So, in the link there, we, we've done a toolkit of our energy journey. That's up until receiving our RCEF bid. So we've literally detailed everything under headings. So do go and have a look. You're very welcome to, um, to do that. And um, one thing we did learn is that no one understood what community energy was. So we needed to, to get a sort of one minute elevator pitch to say, this is what we're doing. So, you know, we, we, we rent the roof space at a peppercorn rent. Um, we have a, a contract, we then sell the energy back to the business owner, farm owner, at a slight discount, uh, we then cover our costs with what's left, and then the, the bit left over then goes into a community energy fund, we can then fund other community energy projects in the village. Um, we raise the money by a share offer, we will pay 4% or 5% return and you can then own your own energy. So it, it's a lovely uh, decentralized model. And that was very, very popular. Once we explained it, we had a little diagram and um, it, everyone was, you know, we, we had a, a really positive response to that. Um, okay, so learning from RCEF, um, basically make sure you put in costs for everything that you need. So we, we tried to do that, but we missed a few things. Uh, luckily, they've been very helpful and flexible, but it's not always going to be the case. So things like website, marketing design, community engagement costs, um, your setup costs as your Bencom, your co-op, um, structural surveys, they're pretty expensive. Now, project management costs, definitely put in for those. We, we didn't do that because we thought we'd do it ourselves. And 
I think with hindsight, we should have definitely done that. And we're certainly doing that for projects going forward because that's a lot of time. Um, cost for your share offer. So Community Energy South can help you get the standard, the share standard mark. Um, so there's cost for that, but then there's also a cost when you get in someone to administer your share offer and they will need to check it too. And that's quite a lot. So we, we weren't aware of those things. So need to make sure you've put um, all of those in. Legal costs, very expensive. Make sure, again, you get three quotes for everything. So the power purchase agreement that you have, so it's a lease and a power purchase agreement in one. So it's a sort of boilerplate lease. It's about 70 pages long. <laughs> so it's, it's worth putting in some time for the legal team to go through that with you. So you understand what that's all about. Uh, because you're going to have to try and explain that to your your site and uh, th there will be a cost for that connection to the grid again there's a cost for that make sure that all goes in um, other learning um, so as soon as you can as soon as you're going to set up elect your directors and get your rules so the co-op have a set of rules that you can use uh, we overcomplicated that slightly by trying to amend them, but of course, everything you amend, it, there is a cost to. So I would say keep it simple. Um, we did also make errors on the legal front. Um, you need to get a title deed for each of your sites, but you only need that when you're definitely going ahead. So don't have to do that straight away. And if it's a big farm or a complicated building, there can be multiple titles. And if the lawyer then does the wrong one, you then have to pay for it. So we've had a little bit of a falling out over that. Um, so just make sure you are absolutely clear as to who the contract is going to be with. Um, invitation to tender. Um, it's useful to have a waiting for each of the, the things that you're looking at, you know, because when they come in, how are you going to decide which is better? Is it their, you know, their experience? Is it health and safety? Is it you know, what is it you're going to be looking at? Bank account, this is just crazy. It, it's taken over 12 weeks. We have been unable to open a bank account. Um, I would start opening a bank account straight away to avoid that. Um, and we still haven't managed to get one open. Um, also make sure you utilize the consultants that you use with RCEF. They're so knowledgeable and it's really handy to have them or, or Community Energy South to come to your meetings because you will be asked questions and we, we had questions we simply couldn't answer and you need to have an expert there to be able to you know to, to explain things to them um really key piece of learning is make sure everyone is on board uh this is what we're struggling with at the moment you can have the whole management team on board but if there is a decision maker who maybe is an owner who only comes in occasionally you know they need to be completely on board because otherwise it, it's very complicated they can become confused. Um, you need to get them uh, need, need to get them on board because they're the ones that are going to be signing. Um, Community Energy South are brilliant, uh, incredibly useful. They can help you with so much stuff. So definitely uh, work as much as you can with them. And uh, I think it's really imperative to have an accountant if you can, because the financial model um, you do need to play around with a lot of numbers. So um, I don't, don't know what we would have done without our accountant. Um, and then the other really obvious thing is, you know, understand the process because it's hard when you're going through it because you don't, although you know where you're going to end up, there are so many things that have to happen. And obviously you'll, you'll build, your consultants can help you make a Gantt chart to show you when it's happening, but it's just the sequence of events. You know, what do you have to do first? What can you do um, after you've done, you know, you've got your viable sites, you need your structural surveys, you need to negotiate with the site. Um, you need them to sign a letter of intent or a PPA or lease before you can in, uh, get the in installer on board. The installer needs to obviously schedule the install. Uh, the share offer will take time to set up, then it will take time to run. So it, it's really important to get a, a handle on exactly what has to happen when and what can't happen before something else has happened. I mean, it, it sounds really obvious, but um, that can, things can take a lot longer than you think, if that makes sense. Uh, so I think 
so I've rattled through a massive amount of two years of work. So I really hope that made sense to everyone. And please ask, ask away your questions. Alison, thank you. That was, uh, yes, clear and uh, just really, really clear and really useful advice as always. I particularly, you know, I like the advice about the bank account and I said we had to have issues and other people also in the chat box put that they'd had issues. So yes, thank you. Uh, we've got three minutes for questions. Wow, I rattled through faster than I thought. <laughs> You've done really well. So if anyone has a question, I suggest you unmute yourself and go for it. And then I'll stop you at 40, 11.45 and we'll, we'll move on to uh, Nicola. Can I, can I ask a question? Please sure. do. Yeah, um, um, that was a great presentation. Did you have sort of um, benefit success measures, that sort of thing? And have you tracked them and seen how well you've done against them? Um, not per se. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess the first one is actually getting the stuff installed. So we've got two sites that we are poised to hopefully install on. Um, but we, so I mean, for me, the only success is actually getting the contract signed. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure there probably are others. And that's a very good question. Um, I guess maybe we should think about that for future. You're not into operation yet. So you won't be able to, make, you won't be able to track your outcomes. Yeah. Yet, that's fair enough. And has anyone else any questions? We actually have two minutes. I'm so impressed how ahead of time we are. I, I'd like to ask a quick one, if I may. Um, hi, Alison. Um, we're just at the early stages of setting up a, a group here in uh, Cookham. And uh, so a lot of what you've said is, is sort of really interesting, sort of questions we've been asking ourselves. Um, I, I'd like to jump, though, just, just to a sort of specific i think you mentioned something about sleeving and, and sort of yes. transferring the electricity from the generation to to the users i mean one of the things that we think would be really helpful if, if was if there was some way of sort of having a local market where the generators could sell direct to the consumers but we, we suspect that the technicalities of the grid and regulation might mean that that's not yet possible is, is, is that what you were talking about that, that sort of problem? um essentially it was taking one of our sites that had a really fantastic roof but virtually no no usage and mm. teaming that up with a third party who had the usage but had a didn't have the right roof but because the electricity then needs to go go across, i don't know the technical terms here mm. in selling that to them there are various charges as it moves and it it, it, it seems to inflate the amount of electricity uh, how much they're paying per kilowatt mm. hour so the only way the, our consultants see that it can work as if the the off taker pays um, a premium so I mean that's not an attractive thing mm. you know because um, I mean although you haven't paid for your solar you're, you're paying a premium um, so we, we can try and sell that to them but I, I I don't feel very confident that we can make that work at the moment unless the situation changes no, and it's a pity because you have all this availability of potential solar PV and you, you can't use it Indeed, and that, that seems to be the holy grail of yeah. uh, you know making these things work on a local level and, and saving the grid having to increase its size and etc um, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, so I was just wondering if you'd solve that, but it sounds like you're still grappling with it. Um, no, I mean we've we've got a sleeving report from our consultants, and you know we we would have to start going down the road of um, getting people to pay more. Mm. So um, not quite sure if we can do that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Sorry, on that one, can I just understand, is there some sort of uh, limit of distance between where the um, solar is captured and where it's supplied that makes a difference? Ali. I don't think it's the distance. I think it's more that it's going from one, it's going from one, um, one place to uh, one person to another. Oh, so I think there the are, transfer. there are charges for transfer. Yeah. I mean, sorry, our, our SSEN Direct will be able to explain that in, in loads of detail, but I'm afraid my knowledge is rather Absolutely. limited on that front. Yeah. Ollie, Ollie, yes, shall we come in here? Because I think probably from Community Energy England perspective, we have grappled with this. Um, certainly when um, in my day when I was on the board at CE and I was dealing with the policy, um, this this was the holy grail is, is this business of selling the electricity you generate. It is probably still the case that if you can sell electricity from a roof down a private wire without going through the grid, 
um, you might be able to get it away, but there is a cost in terms of installing the private work, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is as soon as you put that electricity into the national grid to try and get it to somebody, even if they're next door, unless you can do, do it with a private wire, it's, uh, it's pretty well a non-starter. I mean, Ollie, would you broadly agree with that? Yeah, because um, you have to pay a system charge. You know, it's like a, you know, like a, it's called a GEOS charge for, for the electricity grid. So it's the standard charges. We all pay in our electricity bills a small amount for the electricity network to be managed. And it, it's exactly that reason. Um, now, Ofgem have developed things called sandbox projects where they will look at direct wire supply, you know, like, so if you're in one house and you want your neighbor to benefit, then, you know, there's a way of doing that. Um, the market is evolving. So you've got energy local club, like someone's put in the chat from um, Totnes who are investigating that at the moment. And there's a number of energy local clubs around the country, Bethesda and with Octopus Energy um, at the moment. And then there are other peer-to-peer -peer trading platforms that are coming forward, like City Grid, Urban Chain, which are more um, the dark art of um, trading and things. Um, where they can buy the electricity generated and somehow supply it back to people. But it's evolving fast. I'll put in the link in a minute a, um, an organisation, a think tank that have been pushing government on this, um, who, who community engineering and work very closely with. So it's definitely find your projects, like I say, like a street or a direct project, and let's raise these projects look at examples because it is a space that is evolving at the moment thank you thank you everyone i'm going to hand over to nicola now i've my eye on the clock all the time um, so yeah i'm going to hand over to nicola who's going to talk about renewable heat and projects they've done with made energy thank you liz i'll just find my presentation there it is Okay, well, I'm going to talk about Made Energy because I am one of the um, eight board members of Made Energy, which is East Berkshire, crossing over into North Surrey. Now, we, um, we're going to, I'm going to talk about renewable heat because we've just done a project there which was very successful. So I'll give you an exa that example of our, of our latest Made Energy activity and ideas for new heat projects because, of course, the RHI doesn't exist anymore. I'm trying to move forward on my slides. Nothing's happening. There we go. Made Energy is a community energy organization operating in the area I've just mentioned. We've got seven solar sites uh, amounting to about 400 kilowatts on community buildings, so schools, leisure centers, art center, etc. And one of them is has been done without the feed-in tariff, and that was a large one on a brand new leisure center roof. Our last project was a ground source heat pump initiative, which was a 60 kilowatt power um, heat um, supply on a leisure center. And that was with the uh, renewable heat incentive. We're not huge. Our total assets are um, um, 1.65 of a million. The leisure center that we put the heat pump on um, had eight gas boilers and they were coming to the end of their life. They couldn't afford to replace it. Them. They didn't want to replace them with, um, with gas, uh, they wanted to look at um, low carbon options, especially as there were other financial um, opportunities that came along with that. So we as a community benefit society secured funding for a feasibility study to explore what the options were. And we proceeded with a ground source heat pump covered by a 200k community share investment. It was all very exciting. Um, we were really pleased to, to take advantage of the renewable heat incentive before it disappeared. Interestingly, the site actually wished to own the asset. So we transferred it to them in exchange for future income based on a minimum amount generated from the renewable heat incentive. And it's that financial mechanism that is enabling us to pay our investors both their, um, their, their, their return on their investment and the long-term capital. So it's, it was quite complex. There's a lot of legal agreement to go through. And my colleague, Michael, was um, a genius in navigating that. It took two years um, because the agreements were complex. 
But we were really happy to pass the asset over to the, the site. It was win-win for us because it meant we didn't have to bother with insurance. We didn't have any of the risk associated with maintenance, et cetera. So we were, we were very pleased about that uh, and pushed that forward. The feasibility study um, for us and what it might cover for you if you were looking for a heat project um, would cover community usage and benefits data on the energy usage, um, cost and the carbon savings. The technology, potential for retrofit of that building. So the fabric of the building, the heating systems, tweaking them for optimal efficiency. Um, planning, any permitting issues, then financial projections. So savings that might be made, the cost of the intervention that needs to be done and the financial model. Also the approvals process that might be needed um, if it's for a school, you would need to talk, obviously, with the council, um, the freeholder, um, the Department for Education. If it's an academy, then you've got that in the mix as well. And then the lease le legal agreements, so the lease, potential asset transfer and the power purchase agreements. Well, um, we got a grant to cover most of this. Um, I would propose that most of you, if you were looking at a project like this, you would secure a grant as well, because that's an awful lot to get through. It's an awful lot of expertise you need to accumulate or, or use. Um, we didn't have all that expertise. We had a little bit, but you buy that in. So don't be afraid to venture towards a, a project like what we've achieved, because you buy in that expertise. We did use the, um, the Rural Community Energy Fund for that uh, feasibility study, but hopefully there'll be some alternative in the future. Um, there are other uh, places you can get a grant for feasibility studies. Um, and we are very much on that, um, waiting for, for opportunities all the time. And we do have a list in Surrey that we can look at with you. As Alison said, you don't need to be experts yourselves. You will accumulate the expertise as you buy it in and work with your consultants. So how might you and your group do this without the renewable heat incentive? We suggest choosing an off-gas building with aging boilers, so a building that actually has a, a, an urgent need to, to work with you or, or some solution. And it would be a building user with a definite long-term use so that you can model a response. You would secure an initial grant for the feasibility for that assessment, design, financial modelling. You bring the stakeholders together, and this is key. You would create a plan to reduce the building energy demand and install energy generation. And as a community group, you are really well placed to start changing the behaviours and bring people together. You gain grants and investments. You'd repay investors out of the savings on the energy bills that they were forecasting. But that's the key. And I'm going to show you an example on the next slide. Then you rinse, repeat and share with other groups because that's all about the community uh, energy, the cooperative movement. It's all about sharing your IP, in my view. Um, I find a lot of groups are very open, very sharing, very generous. When I say choose an off gas building, um, point number one there, it might be um, a, a building like a school, a library, a sports venue, a care home or other community building where the freeholder ideally is the occupier or the leaseholder is a long term leaseholder and it supports the community. And I say about supporting the community because that might help you generate interest from investors. Um, they might be more inclined to support um, a building that benefits people rather than a commercial one. But it's different in every scenario. Um, and when I say reducing the building energy demand, I'm talking about things like reducing the incoming voltage that the building uses. Quite often it's set too high. Now I'm not um, a tech, technical expert on this at all, but this is what I've been reading in other, other reports that consultants have created for the schools. Uh, other suggestions have been things like install, installing saber watt devices on equipment like school fridges, insulation, and replacing drafty doors and windows. So that's all part of the package that you would look at. I said I'd give you a financial model example. Here's an example based on a community building with oil heating, high emissions of 73 um, tons of carbon a year. Oh, hang on, wrong slide. I was just trying to move something. 
um, and £32,000 worth of energy bills and rising. This calculation is based on, first of all, that organisation receiving a local grant that would be about 20% of what's needed for the entire package and 80% of community investment. And the idea is that the building repays the investment that you generate from the savings they've made by working with you and making the changes. And the result for the investing community is a supportive place to keep savings. Like if I was an investor, I'd rather put my money here than in the bank. Um, so keeping the savings in the long term carbon reduction, reducing projects and the knowledge that the money is put to good use. Good use. And with this model, we're looking at a 90% cut in carbon emissions. So if I take you through this example, um, the proposal of 20% grants and 80% community investment works out at saving eight tonnes of carbon a year. Energy bills reduction is £13,000 a year. The amount of investment required overall would be 300,000 on this model. Community investment, 240,000. So that's the 80% I mentioned. The grant finance that would be needed to make this model work would be 60,000. And the energy savings per year that the, that the school or building could expect to save would be about 19,000. And the red figure you've got here is what you would need, 16,000 a year, would be the payback to your investors. So the annual return to the investors for them, keeping their money with you. And the savings for school on, on, from a financial perspective are 3,000 a year. The, the current carbon and energy bills on this are, are, are real for an actual example. And the other elements I've just taken you through in the table are show, they show how the model could work. So the community investment is used to decarbonize, the, decarbonize the site, protects the site from future cost increase and a 90% reduction in carbon emissions. And the site uses the savings to repay community investment. Uh, I'm reiterating that because it's sort of a hard model to get your head around. Um, and the use of the grant up front is key because that reduces the overall project cost and the demand for community investment. So that makes the project a good value. And you can model this on different percentages of grants and community investment. Whether this project idea, this model works generally depends on what the starting bills are, the cost of the work to reduce the emissions and the bills, and the grant available for the particular site that you're looking at. But it shows that a relatively small amount of grant may be what you need to kick off a project to succeed without huge costs to the site. My colleague Michael has different um, examples of how this would work, but this is a sort of practice we're thinking about for projects that don't have the opportunity to work with the renewable heat incentive anymore. My last slide, I'll just check. Is it really possible? Well, there is considerable good practice out there already established in the community energy sector and that gives us a lot of confidence in the ability to work with those um, those practices and those models at scale and high fuel prices and the pressure towards net zero have really created a much greater appetite to consider new finance models um, one of the examples that we used um, to create that model that experiment with that model and that table was evidenced by a brilliant recent study called Developing Zero Carbon Schools by the Green Fox Community Energy Group. I really want to credit them for the work they've done. That was funded by Power to Change and supported by the Energy Systems Catapult. That was a project done in 2020, which would have had the RHI in place. But I think there's a huge amount of data and expertise that we can work with. Um, and the Green Fox study, to me, demonstrates the unique ability that community energy groups, so you guys, have in bringing multiple stakeholders together and changing behaviour, because I really don't think that consultants alone can do that, because there's always a, a profit-making element to that, whereas community energy groups, that, that is all put aside because we're volunteers and we're doing this to, um, to reduce carbon. So I think there really is 
good opportunity to navigate. So don't assume because the RHI isn't in place, you can't make change to the building that you really care about. It's on your doorstep because we're going to help you try and work through that. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Nicola. I found that very inspiring. I hope others do too. There are some questions that have been popping up in the chat box, which many of which Michael has responded to, but do keep putting questions in the chat box, particularly the one about community investment. I'm going to hand over to Nigel Roby of Way, is it Roby or Robbie? Roby, <coughs> Roby of Way Valley Solar. And uh, Jesse, you're going to be running his slides for him, aren't you? So just bear with us while Jesse screen shares. Maybe. You ready to roll, Jesse? Okay, uh, well, afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting us to participate. Uh, this is going to be a double header. I'm going to talk about Way Valley Solar, what we've done, what we're working on, what we want to do. Uh, and then Kathy is going to talk about Springbok Wood Heat uh, down in Allfold. Uh, and both of these co-ops are part of the energy for all family of renewable co-ops covering solar, wind, biomass and hydro. Uh, uh, despite the name, we don't just cover schools. Uh, this is what we've got lined up on the screen there. And kind of as, as you'd expect in this context, our approach is entirely non-profit based. Uh, all the directors of the co-ops are unpaid volunteers. So our only motivation uh, just with made energy, just the same as Overton, is to deliver more renewable energy and to benefit the local community. So next screen, please, Jesse. Uh, uh, no, no. Uh, next one after that. There, yeah, thank you. Uh, so who are we? Wave Valley Solar is a community owned energy co-op set up by local people, mainly from the Guildford and Godalming area. Uh, the co-op installs community funded solar on schools and other community organizations free of charge, provides energy efficiency support to its member schools and works with schools and local community groups to maximize the environmental, educational and community impact of the solar installations. We seek to assist schools in their sustainability and educational work and engage the local community. Uh, I, when I listen in some awe to the work of some of the other uh, community energy groups, I think uh, others do that bit of it slightly better than we do. Uh, we started, as you can see from the scheme, uh, in 2011. Uh, we had 238 kilowatts of solar panels on the roofs of six states, the first six you can see there, six state secondary schools in Surrey. Since then, we've completed further solar installations on four more schools, as well as increasing the generation capacity on some of our founders. And in June 2020, we installed panels on St Paul's Church in Adelston. Uh, the first school, Rodborough, uh, well, that was, I suppose, really kind of energised by the head, the then head of Rodborough, Andrew Smith, still a director of Way Valley Solar, who just wanted to engage the pupils with practical things on the climate crisis. He wanted the school to be seen as a pioneer in that area. And he had a, a hell of a big uh, electricity uh, bill that he needed reducing. Um, we've also done low energy lighting, uh, although we tend to operate mainly in solar, cutting energy costs there and improving lighting quality. Um, we're a small local co-op about the same size as Made Energy, uh, but kind of part of a bigger family. Uh, sister co-op, um, Schools Energy, uh, that's now installed solar panels in over 100 schools up and down the country. Uh, and it, it came out of the model that we developed on Way Valley Solar. And both co-ops and Cathy Springbok uh, are underpinned administratively by Energy for All which provides fundraising, accounting, financial, investor database, uh, project management support for, I, th I think it's 31 local energy co-ops from Northwest Scottish Highlands to the New Forest. And a lot of the things that um, have been talked about in 
a number of the different presentations thus far in terms of all that stuff that you need to know and you've got to find someone and pay someone to to uh, deliver the knowledge for you um, that's how energy for all operates uh, all of the co-ops use that as a sort of a central fund and it itself is a not-for-profit but I'll, I'll cover more on that in a tick um, next one please jesse so uh sorry about the neck tilting angle um but that's the panels on st paul's in adelston uh and that was sparked by the work our sister co schools energy did to create what kind of almost seems impossible that it was a solar installation on the cloisters of salisbury cathedral um and kind of what those two showed to my mind is that when organizations themselves want to make a difference and they can trust the partner with whom they're working it's got the heft it's got the scale it's, it's got the experience uh then it not only is adoption of renewables cheap uh, achievable it can actually be relatively quick um and st paul's is an interesting one it's it's small it's, it's not a big installation it's about 10 uh kilo p um 10.4 i think um and you would think a church um because it's mainly sunday oriented wouldn't quite work um that it wouldn't be able to use up the energy generated um but it's a very very active community-based church and sadly in these times it also has to provide a, a lot of support for uh things like food banks and that sort of stuff so actually it is easily using up the the the, the generation uh, from the panels there uh, so what do we do? I'll kind of rattle through this because it's it's very much the same as uh, Overton and Maid. We'll identify the site. It's it's the same process where the Way Valley's initiated a contact or it's been the school or the local authority or whatever. We'll get the desktop assessment done and we work with one partner throughout uh, Way Valley Solar and Solar uh, Schools Energy, who are Joju Solar. They'll be able to establish for us you know, within a week um, that what the sort of installation is possible, what sort of uh, size array we can manage, and what sort of output we will get. Um, it's it's not definitive, but it gives an indication. With that, we can create the feasibility study again talked about elsewhere. We we now have we talked about. Um, the accountants very necessary in this bit of the process we've now got a, a, a template that has worked over a hundred installations so we can map out the year by year what the school or the local authority or the institution is, is going to save and with a lot of ours um slightly different uh, to some we are reducing the the energy bills of the school or the church um, but we're also kind of creating a, a, a fund for them uh, through the surplus and because there are sort of all we are doing is allocating a tiny percentage back to energy for all um, effectively that is all but 100 percent of the the surplus that the project generates and of course we're doing exactly the same uh, we're fundraising um, but before that, we'll, we'll, we'll go through the process, as you'd expect, with the bursts of the head of governance, whoever it is. Um, if the, the school, the institution wants to go ahead, uh, in principle, then we'll, we'll get the, the structural and electrical, electrical survey done um, to make sure that the installation is going to be safe and efficient. Um, and all of this is, is everything's free to the, the, the host organisation. Uh, We'll then adjust the, the model, uh, see what works. Uh, at the moment, the cost of uh, panels on an installation has increased quite rapidly over the last few months, not particularly because of manufacture, but because of the supply chain issues that have come uh, possibly through um, a political decision. Don't know. Um, uh, but that's, that's had a massive blip upwards. Um, so we've had to adjust some of our expectations on that. But equally, sometimes it can go the other way. Uh, we had one the other day where we were looking at it, and the when Georgie went in on site, they could see that actually uh, 
there was probably about 10% more that could be generated by that particular roof space. So we're going through that. Um, we're then going back to the host organization um, and you know, the model is, is the same as you would expect. Um, the, the host organization, the church, the hospice, the school is paying nothing uh, for the um, for the panels and their maintenance, and we we do that throughout, and that's if that's effectively where energy for all come in um, because they can do the remote monitoring. If a problem emerges from that, they can see we're looking across our different uh, sites, and we've got eleven schools and the and the church, but within each school, I think uh, I think Rodborough, for example, has uh, two areas. Um, Godalming College has two areas. Um, so we're looking at each of the generation of those uh, um, individually each month. If we can see there's a blip, sometimes it's a nice blip. Um, sometimes it can be that um, it's operating at 70% of what we would expect it to. And then we've got to investigate. And that's probably where Energy for All uh, would say, you know, Nigel, can you pop round um, and see what the, the problem is? Um, with obviously the, the building manager of the, the school. So uh, that's our process. I've spoken about energy for all a, a bit. So Jesse, if I might just get you to move on to the next screen. So that's who, that's who they are. Um, and that's all of their installations. And they operate in exactly the same way for us as they do for a, a, a hydro scheme in in Araka near Loch Lomond. Um, uh, and it's it's this it's exactly the same ethics. You know, it's they are effectively operating almost like a super co-op um, because they're uh, aggregating the work of 30 different co-ops. So and each of those co-ops on a regional basis will have a project manager allocated. So we've got a great chapel, Zach. Um, who looks at both after uh, Way Valley Solar, but he's also looking after schools energy. So we've got some great knowledge sharing there. So a lot of the issues that might crop up if you're going from a standing start um, have already been cleared. Um, fundraising, for example, uh, if, if, if we want and we do want to have another fundraising over the next few months, um, it's, it's not exactly just press a button, but it's quite close. Um, so the, I think the advantage is of, of the, having this combo of the local group and energy for all support is that our partners, particularly when we get to larger institutions who are a little wary of, of small organizations, how much they may want to work with them, is that they know that they're dealing with someone who's got, who can manage at scale. Um, and they've got proof of delivery. We've done 11 projects, Schools Energy has got 100 schools. Uh, in total, the co-ops uh, underpinned by Energy for All have something like 240 projects. So there's lots of stuff that I don't need to worry about and my other directors don't need to worry about because it's been done. We can just plug into that knowledge. Um, but those same councils, churches, schools know that they're they're still dealing with a local organisation because we're local. We share the same enthusiasms because we're residents in the area, and it's you know it's been a great success. Energy for all and its co-ops have raised something like eighty two million on for community energy projects over the how long have they been going? I think uh, about. Can't remember how long ago, but 2009, I think, but um, I'm not sure. So, Jesse, uh, next one, please. And we're, we're very proud of what we've done, but we want to go a lot faster and deliver a lot more carbon reduction. Uh, if, fingers crossed, uh, all the projects that we're working on at the moment, at various stages of development, um, if they all came off, possibly to be fair, all the discussions we're having. Um, if they came off, then we have about twice as much generation as we currently have. And currently that's about um, above, um, 600. So, 
Um, so we're talking at the moment with, with a hospice, uh, a multi-school academy, uh, three individual schools, a sports club, um, and with Waverley. Um, and here on Waverley, you can see the, the leisure centre uh, sites that they're doing, um, or they're talking about. Uh, the, the Waverley experience for us, you know, you know, we're still fingers crossed, obviously, um, but I think the way the reason why that's worked is that the, the portfolio lead, the councillor with the portfolio on sustainability, Steve Williams, and the, the members of the sustainability team have got so much enthusiasm for it that we've we spent quite a long time now, um, probably six, nine months, talking to them, refining for them so that they can feel confident going to the exec, um, the full council exec. So, and that's what they're going to do now. They're quite large um, installations, or certainly uh, Farnham and uh, Broadwater are, um, but not massively different to some of our schools um, like Beacon. And I think, again, with the following wind, Godalming College will get an extension this year and that will make it quite a, a chunky site. Um, and next slide, and then I think I'm pretty much done. Um, uh, so from our point of view, what we need is the same as everybody else. We need the, the school governors, the trustees, the church leaders to be, the councillors to be saying, we've got decent sized roof space that could work for solar, just get in touch. We need, we, we're going out that way. We need a bit more momentum coming back this way. Um, and we don't need or want to be exclusive project partners. You know, if there are local, you know, community energy groups who have a desire uh, and a, a, a notion of where they that solar is possible um, or heat is possible um, then if it helps to have us involved as a partner because we got that track record and it might be a useful influence we're very very happy to do that um, so we're not a kind of you know our way or the highway type thing um, and at larger uh, scale we we need probably Guildford as much as anything else and uh, hands up I haven't approached Guildford very vigorously um, but if we can get Guildford working with us in the way that we hope Waverley can that would be wonderful um, and it was fantastic to hear from Surrey earlier that you know they are they are so keen to engage with community energy groups um, because in the past, I, I, dealing with Surrey and all the, the big institutions, you know, the Diocesan Board of Education, the NHS, those big monoliths are so hard to break through. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm, we're just hopeful that maybe now, when things are so urgent, that the bureaucratic barriers will um, come tumbling down. Um, so that's Way Valley and that's Energy for All. And I'll hand over to Cathy now for a very different and very successful uh, project, Springbok. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, Jesse's just getting Cathy's presentation up. Oh, Kathy, yeah, you'll, you'll gather that the um, Way Valley Springbok um, brace have opted not to grapple with the technology. Um, so <laughs> we, we subcontracted that. Right. Uh, okay, I think that it doesn't matter, but that's the second slide, so I better introduce myself. My name's Cathy Smythe, and I'm a director of Springbok um, Sustainable Wood Heat Cooperative. Um, and since, yeah, thanks. You do go to the second slide, Jesse. Thank you. Um, so this cooperative, which is a wood chip biomass district heating system, has been operational since June 2015. Um, the host and the main uh, heat customer is Care Ashore, which is a charity for former seafarers. It's down in Allfold, southwest Surrey, which is it's so close to West Sussex, it's nearly in West Sussex. We provide a low carbon heat solution uh, by using locally and sustainably sourced wood. This is the benefit of bringing unmanaged woodland, of which there is a lot, back into management in a cost-effective way. There is a cost of bringing woodland back into management, and it utilizes the poor quality waste wood and supports the local forestry industry. Indeed, as I speak, um, 
the um, hand cutters are going into my woodland and they're uh, hopefully looking at the winter supply. You have to think ahead. We supply a residential complex, and you'll see a photo later, plus a further 22 bungalows, flats, and maisonettes, which are spread throughout the ground. So the heat is sold to the main customer care ashore, but also to the individual residents. And this requires a billing infrastructure, which is run for us by Energy for All, and we pay them an admin fee. So the initial price for the heat um, was determined in June 2015. It was at that point slightly less than the price of oil, but we, I'm pretty proud of this actually. We have managed to maintain the price for heat to the customers at 2015 levels. We've done that largely by switching to sell supply of wood chip since about 2020. Um, and for those that are aware of these things, we're a biomass suppliers list registered producer trader. The other source of income is the renewable heat incentive at 2015 rates, but that is index linked. Surplus after payment of the operating costs all goes back to care ashore. That would increase over time. In terms of the economics, um, at the time uh, this worked, the hamlet was off the gas grid and the care ashore needed to replace the old and very inefficient boilers. They hadn't got the capital to do that. And so there was a very happy marriage of community energy ability to raise and their need. And in terms of biomass, we think um, Martin Crane, for those of you who know, has calculated that we're saving about 220 tonnes of carbon a year. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, <clears throat> so that's us at the first AGM. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about getting projects going. Ours took about two and a half years from concept to commissioning. Um, I shout out here for John Hubbard, who I think is on the call, who did our uh, energy audit. Um, and it was a pretty hairy seven month build over the winter. <clears throat> the share offer at the two share offers raised £425,000. That covered the capital cost plus some operating profit, which we needed. Um, given the source of fuel. Uh, the co-op has about 120 members, five volunteer directors. It isn't like doing solar. I mean, you may have picked up that I've had experience, some slightly secondhand experience of uh, solar, wind and hydro. I am a serial cooperative member. Um, but here the difference is the requirement to supply the fuel, the wood chip, you have to stay on top of that. Um, the need to meter, monitor, heat output, operate billing and credit control. And then the sheer responsibility. I mean, this is a 20 year project and we've undertaken to provide this customer with heat and hot water, these customers, I should say, for 20 years. And we can't just switch off and go over to the cats or electricity grid. Next slide, please. Um, right, so this is our system layout. We've got about just a fraction under half a kilometre of district heating pipe. We're running two 200 kilowatt boilers. Um, it was done that way because of the way the RHI was structured. There are two uh, oil backup boilers, which are absolutely essential because the wood chip boilers have to be switched off uh, 24 to 36 hours before maintenance, which is quarterly. And you also calculate that they, they are doing about 90% of the heat load, but if we have, say, one to two weeks of extremely cold temperatures, you um, bring the oil boilers on to top up the heating. I'll explain a bit more about that in a minute. And as I think I've said, we have produced our own wood chip um, since 2020. Just going to the pictures, um, you'll see from this, we've got quite a lot of heat main uh, particularly down to the bungalows and arm houses. So this is a less efficient in terms of um, heat losses system than the main heat load. Um, the cost that the two systems balance each other. Um, that is, a, if I was doing this in person, I'd be waving a sample piece of pipe around. That's two, two cores that taking the water out and bringing the water back. And that's just a snapshot of our wood chip barn. Um, in the shot below. Can I have the next slide, please? 
Okay, so this is what we're actually supplying. On the left, we have this large Victorian pile. On the right, we have a really grotty 60s block of studio accommodation. That's off um, Boiler South. And then Boiler North is, is supplying these smaller and, and very spread out individual units. Um, next slide, please. And this is the actual operation. Um, when we started, we were using commercial wood chip from Southeast Woodfields who have been excellent. Um, that came in a trailer and was tipped into the underground fuel silo. That's an inside view of the silo. The fuel is moved by a series of springs and augers up to the boilers. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so the two boilers, um, you can see the augers sort of coming up through, through the floor. Um, I've learned an awful lot about this sort of thing. I mean, it doesn't run itself. We don't do, we, because Kershaw have got residents, um, estate staff, they deal with the fairly num numerous glitches you get. Um, it's, um, I don't actually know how many, but in any year, I think we get five or six periods, but it switches over to oil and it's seamless. But I mean, there's, there's stuff like, Stuff like this is not supposed to get through a boiler, but this did turn up in one of the ash tins. How it got through, I still don't know, but I need now use that as a paperweight. Um, next slide, please. So the <clears throat> boilers are heating the 500 litre, each, each of those tanks contains 500 litres of water. That goes off around the site, um, pumped by the double headed pumps you can see on the right. So it's pumping water out to um, a sort of point of entry at each building. Each building's got a different point of entry. It's got a heat exchanger. At that point, having delivered the heat, in theory, our responsibility stops and the care assure system takes over. It doesn't quite work like that. It's, there's a lot more interaction between the two systems. And then in the foreground, you see the oil backup boilers. Next slide, please. Um, and then switching um, back to the ecology point, um, this is what I was talking about in terms of unmanaged woodland. This was my woodland in about 2012, 2013. This is overstood hazel coppice. The, it is summer, it may not look like it, because there's nothing on the ground, but you can see there are leaves on the trees. But this is the problem. When you've got um, this sort of overstood woodland, you get no floral fauna on the ground because there's no light. Um, I haven't actually got one of a picture of um, new flora and fauna, but if we go to the next slide, you'll, you'll start to. Um, right. This is now where we're stacking the wood. Um, I put this one in because it's a good example of showing what really low quality wood we're talking about. We can make that into chip and we can make that work. The timber industry can't generally do that. One reason we can make this work financially is because of the um, very short distance, it's all moving. I mean, the, uh, this is within uh, half a mile of the actual centre. Um, and um, the ecology benefits, though, we've been managing these woodlands now for butterfly management. Next slide, please. And, and it's gone better than we ever could have hoped. 2015, um, it one of the directors is Tom Parker. Quite a few of you have probably come across Tom at Repower Balkan, and he's a butterfly enthusiast. And he said, Kathy, we think you can do great things in the woodland, and you've got this very rare butterfly down in that neck of Surrey. It's the only part of the southeast. It's called the wood white. I think we could get it from the Forestry Commission woodland next door into your wood. Um, and that was about 2015. The only butterfly we had in the woodland was... Um, speckled wood in 2015 and we're now up to 28 species and as of last year we've got the wood white and they're breeding. Um, next slide please because that was a library photo but this is a photo of a pair of mating wood whites in Springbok in sorry in Park Cops which is our woodland by kind of permission of the marvellous Neil Hume who um, is a uh, conservation expert with um, Butterfly Conservation Sussex Branch. Thank you very much. That's it.
thank you so much. That was absolutely inspiring. So lovely to see the pictures of the butterflies and to, you know, hear the positive biodiversity story that can come out of wood fuel heating and managing um, woods sustainably. So thank you for that. Lovely end. Um, how are we doing for time? I'm going to hand straight over to Nikki, Nikki Myers from Avesco now to talk about energy saving. And I do invite people to put questions for Cathy into the chat box. Right, uh, can everyone see my screen? Great. And uh, Cathy, I used to work for South East Wood Fuel. So I'm glad that you were pleased with that. I didn't know that. Yes. Um, so now I work for Avesco, um, and what I'm going to talk about today is this concept of powering up that Ollie referred to from Energy Alton, and also then powering down as well. So a little bit of an overview of what we do, really. Um, Avesco has been going for 15 years, um, a community benefit company, community um, energy company. Um, so this is our concept, um, community-owned renewable energy systems, uh, first put up on Harvey's Brewery in the heady days of feed-in tariff um, and now on schools. Um, we like keeping the electricity prices low for communities. Um, we see this as long-term community resilience and also obviously are powering up um, from fossil fuels to renewable power. And Liz, I can't remember the number, but Liz will know what our target is to try and get um, renewable um, uh, power in Lewis. I think it's something like 26 megawatts, is it? But anyway, I'm useless at remembering these things, but Liz will put it in the chat for me. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, <sighs> Ah, yes, problem. How do you, ah, here we go. Um, sorry, again, I'm not used to, to Zoom so much. Um, I work on a project called Community Heat, which is part of our powering up and also our, the innovation side of what Avesco does. And we're developing basically a whole system, a whole plan view of how um, communities can transition from, in this case, oil, onto clean energy, uh, electric, electric energy. And we are, um, we're working with UK power networks um, who need to know how to um, size the future energy grid, electricity grid. And also with um, Borough Happold, the engineering company that I think somebody referred to the engineering companies that we have to work with um, in the field that we, we work in. Um, and we're looking at this community level local area um, plan and um, decarbonisation strategy. Um, we're working with Barkham, not Balkham, but Barkham in East Sussex, who are off gas. Um, and this um, also interacts with local area energy planning. Um, and Liz ran um, uh, a webinar a couple of weeks ago um, around this very subject. So we see that Community Heat engages with the community and it gives everyone an en energy plan. And I'm going to kind of talk about this a, a little bit more because you know there's a concern to leave people behind and that's what we really don't want to do. Um, we're writing the book for everybody else um, we also look at how the whole community can own that, that energy production, um, giving them this resilience that we, we talk about. And um, also we, we see that energy champions are really key to um, this transition. And I'm going to talk more about that as well. Um, and then this is a little bit of the, um, the results so far from our community heat project. And we're looking to take this project and expand it. To, to further clusters, um, other areas within UK power networks to see how, um, how that works, how we can, how we can, um, how we can take that forward. So this is Barkham, 703 homes in the community, 500 with energy performance certificates. We fitted 44 with heat and power metering to see really what was going on in the houses. Um, and we carried out, it's actually more than that, um, we carried out 150, almost 150 heat loss surveys and plugged all this information into the engineering company's digital twin of the village so we could start to really model what the future will look like in a whole plan way. 
And I'm coming on to energy champions. So we, we see that it's really key within communities that there's um, you know, embedded um, uh, trusted energy champions who can support people um, in this transition and that, that these people are given, uh, tra are given training to give advice to homes. So it will be you know, energy saving advice, it will be um, bill checking, you know, really um, supporting people in looking at their bills and understanding their bills. Um, for some people, it will be um, supporting them to 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 get um, any funding available. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we, we're seeing people struggling. Um, and then also to really support people in this transition from fossil fuel heating to clean energy. Um, you know, if we're talking about heat pumps, heat pumps uh, heat our houses in a different way. It's a different heating system. And we feel that people really need support in understanding that and understanding how this new heating system works. Um, and if we're retrofitting houses, you know, there's going to be disruption and people are going to need support in, in that journey because, um, you know, it can be quite major for, for houses. And also to talk about the climate crisis, you know, around energy, there's going to be other things to um, to talk about the climate crisis, but we're, we're best placed to talk, talk about energy and the climate, climate crisis. Um, so out of um, Community Heat um, has come a, a support program for communities wanting to start that, that journey, and we're calling it Kickstart. Um, and uh, we can provide a few uh, tools and a, um, a framework for, for communities to start to engage uh, with, with everybody um, within their community to look at, for example, archetypes of houses, how their properties are using heat, um, sending out questionnaires asking how people use heat, perhaps having a, um, uh, an event, um, providing energy, um, information and then to uh, to also provide a final report uh, around this um, uh, to feedback into the community. So if your village is interested in this, then please let us know and we can we can get back to you. And then um, just touching on the idea of powering down. Um, you know, giving back to the community, supporting our community, giving energy advice um, and bill checking. So Avesco is being supported with uh, funding from UK Power Networks through their Power Partners um, uh, scheme. Uh, so we have funding to give energy advice to householders, not along the lines of how to retrofit your house with, you know, solid wall insulation, but more along the lines of, you um, you, you know how to how to make small changes, behavior changes to bring your um, to bring your um, uh, bills down. Sorry, and I flipped off that. And then also we have um, funding through Citizens Advice for big energy saving network bill checking, which in the past was more about changing to a cheaper tariff, but obviously now it's just about consolidating and also helping people to access any funding that they they can. Um, explaining what's happening in the energy markets, explaining the, the, the funding that the government's giving to us all. Um, and already, you know, we're seeing, um, we're seeing people really struggling um, uh, with the rising cost of bills, they're getting into debt, they want to know what financial support's available. So we're signposting people, we're able to signpost people to, you know, the limited support that is out there. Um, and obviously, um, we're finding things like, uh, you know, people who have chronic illness need to have a warm house, um, finding that clients are having to stay in bed to keep warm because they can't afford to heat their houses. There are issues with houses with mold and condensation, and this is, gives health problems. Um, as I said, energy debts, you know, in the thousands, and this is even before the price rise. How can we afford to pay our bills in the in the future, especially problems with people in private rented properties um, and also having to explain how some of the new tech works, you know, um, solar thermal not working properly, how a whole house mechanical ventilation with heat recovery system works and how much energy it takes, 
you know, lots of air source heat pumps um, uh, not working properly because they haven't been put in properly. Um, and that's it. I've been really quick um, because I know that we're due a break. This is our contact details. There isn't an email address there, but I'll put my email address in the um, in the chat. Any questions? There's a question from Chris Tuff in the chat box, which may be appropriate for you or for Ollie to answer. No, oh, I can't see it. Um, uh, oh, here we go. More local who attend local community hubs. Hubs. Yes. Is that a simple yes? You do. Well, the reason <laughs> I've said it, so I don't want to jump in. The reason I've said it, it's all about localism. It's it about is. small getting large. Yep, that's that's my my um, idealism on all. Yeah. I am a community um, energy champion anyway. Um, yeah. I attend um, community halls, churches, mining groups, yeah. um, where they've got their, their um, social events. Um, and it seems that people are still very unaware on how to um, reduce energy bills. I'm not talking about having a cup of water going into a kettle, which is what is happening now, how people are doing it. But it's more... Um, uh, giving the advice and reassurance to people on how to do it by um, initiating uh, a home visit to see how they can do it without retrofitting initially because people listen on how they could do the small things without any great expense and there just seem to be a lack oh sorry sorry Liz well, I just want to interrupt for a moment because I'm very conscious that we've gone over time a bit. That you're you were raising something that we debate a lot in the Yes. Um, you so you're raising a very hot issue, uh, but I'm also conscious that we we've gone over time and people might want to get lunch before they come back for the session on seed funding. Uh, so what I'd like to suggest is I, I've 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 established some breakout rooms. Um, so I would suggest that uh, go get your lunch, come back and join a breakout room. I uh, just need to launch them. Um, and um, and then I'm going to suggest that uh, some of our speakers kind of go into different breakout rooms, a bit like you would if you were in a real event and you were schmoozing from this little interesting group of people to this little interesting group of people. And so, Chris, I would invite you and Nikki to uh, join the Not Surrey breakout room and um, continue this conversation I think probably a lot of people will also want to join yeah I'm really sorry but I'm not able to come back um, possibly well I possibly got a call at half one um, but it's probably not going to happen but I just need to be away at half one into that call and then I'll be able to come back in um, so I'll try and I don't know how I'll do it I'll ask Liz how to do it <laughs> yeah, and join you Chris hopefully and we can have a discussion well I could get I'll always get in touch anyway be yeah, you will do, please, yes, because yeah. I'd love yeah. to hear from you. That would be just brilliant. Thank yeah. you. So just to say to everybody, um, there are lunch breakout rooms, get your lunch, and we will meet you back here in the main room at a quarter past one. So you've only got half an hour. Um, and I do hope, do hope you get to do some great networking. Uh, and yes, and I'm really sorry, Chris, to have interrupted you like that. It is a, it is a big topic. Um, and there may be others want to talk to you about it. So, yeah, join Not Breakout Room and see if others come in and have things to say to you. John Hubbard will be liaising, will be chairing a session um, at uh, half, well, 25 to 2 about energy savings. So it will also be something to discuss there. And I see there's a bit of a lively conversation going on in the chat about woodland management and the whole wood fuel debate. <laughs> right. Does anyone else have anything they want to say? Otherwise, you get some lunch. I'm ravenous. I'll just mute myself. For those of you. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to say we've got Patrick Culligan from uh, Surrey County Council, who's going to talk about the Your Fund Surrey uh, and um, funds available for initial groups. Oh, oh. That. we've still got the breakout rooms, still haven't quite rejoined us. <laughs> I've been a little bit early. Just feels like it's us at the moment. 
Oh, here comes Chris. Welcome, Chris. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, we're going to start or kick off this afternoon with Patrick Culligan from Surrey County Council talking about funds available from the council. And then we're going to go out into breakout rooms uh, where you can talk either uh, about schools, churches, heat, village halls or energy saving. And I'll let you select the breakout rooms, but um, I'll hand over to Patrick, first of all. Perfect, thank you, Liz. Um, welcome everyone, thank you for having me today. Um, looking forward to uh, having a conversation about, about your fund, Surrey. Um, in terms of, those of you that don't know what your fund, Surrey is, um, it's Surrey County Council's sort of flagship community grant program um, based around capital funding projects. So it's all about, I'll, I'll go through sort of the vision, the principles, the links, links to climate change, um, the steps to success, which is essentially our sort of application process. And then hopefully we'll have some good, you know, 10 minutes or so to a little bit of a QA and a for you to ask any questions of me. Um, that's key today, really. Whistle through some, some slides, then hopefully you might have some conversation that you wanna sort of have with me. So we'll move on to the vision of your fund, sorry. Liz, you're right, now that as soon as I'm talking, it sticks. There you go. So the vision. Now, what your fund, sorry, is all about is bringing community-led placemaking projects to life, which have a focus on bringing together of the wider community, which to us means making sure that there's the whatever pro, whatever the project is that comes forward, it's not servicing just one or, or two individuals or groups. It, it's creating a community asset really that that is multifaceted and could leave a, a real legacy for you know 25, 30, 50 years in the future. So that so that it, you know that asset and, and whatever that project is has a real impact. There's up to 100 million of capital funding available over a five-year period. So we're, we're in, we've just passed our first year. Um, that's not to say that we have to spend 100 million. Uh, that's just what, what's been, been budgeted. So you know, we're not, it's not as if we're um, handing out money left, right and centre. It's all about the right projects. And hopefully, you know, we get enough right projects that are, so we can you know spend that, that allocation that we've got. In terms of um, what we're closely aligned to and, and how we select and, and um, what we look for in a project is we look for it to be projects to be closely aligned to the community vision for Surrey for 2030, which is a Surrey vision strategy, essentially, which um, details sorts of 10 ambitions that, that the council has for Surrey to be by 2030. I'll, I'll go into a couple of them in a bit more detail in, in a minute, um, but the vision is essentially around making sure Surrey is a place in which communities feel supported by the council and that communities can support each other and that they the people feel like they, they own, they have ownership of their, of their community themselves. Um, and then also ensuring that nobody's left behind in, in, in Surrey and that you know inequalities are addressed and everybody has a fair chance um at, you know at whatever it is their passions are and, and they have a fair chance whilst living in Surrey. Following on from that the fund supports the vision further by building sort of active and um, participatory communities and what we mean by that again is we want projects going forward to us that are truly led by, by the community, um, and that the ideas come from the community. It's about a community coming together who've identified that this, there's X, Y, and Z in, that's missing that, you know, that would really enhance the, the experience of living in that, in that place and giving them the opportunity to come together and actually do something about it and feel like the council is listening to them rather than rather than a council telling a community, right, you need this, you need that. 
And again, that, that leads on to the next point around building a new relationship with residents, a different type of relationship where, where the council is actually working for people rather than the council potentially being seen as working to residents. We want to hear from residents, we want to hear their ideas, we want to hear their thoughts and their projects and support them to put, to put that in place, essentially. And then finally, around the vision, obviously COVID-19, can't escape it over the last few years. Um, this fund has the, has the potential to sort of reju rejuvenate and stimulate local communities, bring um, areas back to life that potentially have, you know, not over the last couple of years haven't had as much footfall or haven't been able to, you know, really do, do and serve their community. Move on to key principles of the fund. So we'll, we'll start up on the left there, um, just sort of those five or six key principles behind the fund. The top one is um, really important for us around being, being open and transparent and, and, and having a supportive approach. Um, you may have noticed when I introduced myself, I, so I'm a project advisor. There's a team of five of us and we are advisors. You know, we're not um, we're not the scorers, you know, we're not the, the gatekeepers to the fund. We're there to support applications and, and support communities to, to get their idea, hopefully, all the way through to funding. Um, it's, it's not a, if an idea comes to us, we'll work with that, with that group to, if, it, if we think it doesn't quite fit the criteria, we work with people and we help them to support and support them to try and make it a bit more um, suitable for our fund. It's, other than you know, it, other funds potentially in the past, there may have been no, that doesn't work. See you later. Whereas this time, you know, we're trying to work with people to to help them get to a point where it potentially could be be fundable. Um, it's, it's also important for us that there's a, a wide access across across Surrey, across the county. Uh, it's something which we're working on at the moment. Obviously, as like I said, we're about a year in now, so the data the data picture is starting to come through around where we get applications from. So we can really try and hone down on that in the next 12 months to ensure that areas that areas of the county that aren't sort of applying for funds through your fund can um, you know, we, we find out why and sort of add some capacity in those areas to, to try and help those communities come forward. Um, again, a focus on being community led and community initiated. Um, I think I've covered that quite clearly already. The, the next point around projects being innovative, potentially something where the space that we're talking about today, where that comes in around projects that are, are new, around um, energy saving, around energy producing, whatever it is that your ideas are, that innovative element of, of our principle is, is where potentially some of your ideas might come in. And we're keen also that we don't um, harbour sort of direct competition between applicants between areas you know not you know this or oh, we want this community centre we want that community centre it's about um ensuring that you know the whole community is behind an idea and that you know we, we don't want to start um causing sort of some local arguments because you know we're we're taking two applications of very similar nature along the whole sort of process as it were finally there around the barriers for entry. I'll talk you through sort of the, some of the stages uh, um, later on, but yeah, it's hopefully it's quite a low barrier to entry and that you don't necessarily need to have years of grant funding and expertise to sort of access the funding. And with that box at the top there, um, those are the, uh, the organizations that we can accept applications from. Um, so I think there, there may be some our own district council colleagues on the call today. So we can't, for example, accept applications from those organizations themselves, but in, in the case of potentially, um, it's not quite community energy linked, but a renovation of a, of a children's play park, there might be a, a friends of the park group who can be the lead applicant and then the borough and the district councils can still support that group. But we can't be, we can't have political organisations essentially that are the, the forerunner, as it were, for, for applications. And then also 
but we can't accept applications from. You can have a look through there. And fortunately, if you do fall into any of those brackets, we can't can't accept an application from you. Now, the links to climate change. Um, so I think Melania, my colleague from County Council, spoke about the sorry climate change strategy um, earlier on today. So I won't go into that, but the, anything that comes forward to us to your fund, which is working towards supporting that is something we would be interested in having a look at. The community vision, I talked about those 10 ambitions for Surrey. Two of them are there, and you can see how those visions can link well with um, community energy and you know, the green agenda. It, it says that they're green communities, environmental responsibilities, um, and sustainable growth as well, which is, is key for us. Um, and that's where we, we hope that we may be able to see some applications come forward through this sort of space. Um, you know, the, the net zero sort of goal and that sort of stuff is a huge, huge target for us. And we want the fund to be able to support residents to go ahead and, and, and try and move towards that. And then the six steps to success. So as I said, as I talked about earlier, these are essentially are the, the process. Um, development of your idea. We have an interactive map on one of our, on our website where you can pin your idea and you can start to gain community support. The idea submission is almost like the expression of interest, like your first submission. We work with you then to thrash out your idea. Um, hopefully then put in a full submission. It'll go through assessment to a panel for shortlisting and then hopefully award of funding. Um, won't go through this in too much detail, obviously, because time constraints, et cetera, but just so you can see, you know, what it looks like from, from the outset, I guess. Um, and we're more than happy to have conversations with applicants at any point um, through these through these six steps, um, one-to-ones, half an hour conversations to help support you through whichever stage it is that you might be at. And thankfully, I think we've got about five minutes now as well. Hopefully that gives you a sort of whistle-stop tour of, of your fund and what we're here to do and how we can potentially link with conversations being had today. Um, and I'm, I'm open for questions. If anyone's got any ideas, any thoughts, they want to run past me any questions, then please do raise your hand and, and we can go from there. We'll put a, if you could put a question in the chat potentially. Great, um, thanks so much, Patrick. Great. Um, actually, the way we do it is a little bit more anarchic. We just invite people to unmute themselves and throw Go a question at you. Go for it. I'd be curious to see if there are questions. Who? Oh, John Hubbard has his hand up. So, John, do un unmute yourself. Does he have his hand up? Oh, okay. Yes. That was a mistake, actually. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hi Patrick, can I ask you something? Hi, yeah, of course. I've just private messaged you actually. Um, I, I work with Surplus Food and um, mm -hmm. I'm, we've been feeding the community during lockdown mm -hmm. and we've had quite a lot of funding from the community, etc. I was the poster girl for GoFund Surrey saying, think big. So we're yeah. working with Fair Share, which is uh, a countrywide charity. You mustn't, I'm yeah. sure you've heard of it. They want three million to get a depot in the Guildford area. To, mm -hmm. to they're passionate about food waste, and yeah. they are encountering. And I know you won't be able to answer this, <laughs> but a lot of people, a lot of um, small groups, have had their funding. They are encountering problems, and I wondered whether you could shed any light on that. That it's just the council's just not making a decision. It's just not making a decision for them. Yeah, I. I'm, I'm aware of their application and I'm, oh, okay. I'm, I'm aware that it's um, in terms of the conversations they're having with the council around their you know, application are probably two or three steps above, <laughs> above my pay grade in terms okay. of who they're meeting with. And I think there is a conversation coming up fairly soon okay. um, between fair share and powers that be within the council. Um, I unfortunately don't know anything else on that specifically, um, but it's, I think, the larger applications, big applications, a million pound, three million pound, as you said, um, obviously this is still public money. And so we are yeah. 
it does have to be a lot of, sort of due diligence and um, it, it can be, I, I guess it could be frustrating um, and it is frustrating for, for applicants or who are coming in for those big amounts. Um, but there, there is a process that as a council that has to be followed. Um, and yeah, that one is in hand. I, I don't know. I can't give any more information I'll, I'll no, okay. other than that. But um, it is, it's definitely one that is cropping up a lot for us. And there is, yeah, like I said, it's been passed up the food chain, as it were, to, to sort of the, the powers that be. My, I've got a view, <laughs> I've got a vision that if mm -hmm. we could save if we could save food waste, nobody need go hungry in this country. It's just a, an outrage. And so the, I'm, we are passionate about diverting as much as we can from landfill. So, you know, that's part of it. Anyway, I know it's not your, <laughs> your deal, but anyway, <laughs> thank you for listening to me. No problem, thank you. Thank you, Claire. That actually sounds like quite an inspiring project. Oh, it yeah. is. <laughs> Does anyone else have questions for Patrick? Because if not, I'm going to open the breakout rooms um, for those of us who are left. Actually, before anything else, I'm quite curious about if the, so just please put in the chat box. I'm curious about if the information we've given you, if we've targeted it right, or if it's a little bit overwhelming, or if you find it inspiring. And I'd be really useful to know, it would be really useful for me as the organiser to know uh, how, how this session has been for you and if useful or not. You can always private message me if you're worried about saying something uncomfortable in public. Um, so I'll just leave that with you as a question that I'd be really grateful if you could answer. I'm now gonna open breakout rooms. Thank you, Holly. <laughs> Um, and uh, just remind you of the rooms. It, you can join whichever room you prefer, whichever room is most interesting for you. So we've got Chris Rowland from Avesco is going to be um, in the, he's, Avesco have done a lot of solar school projects. So Chris is going to be chairing the session on schools. So Chris, you need to go there or maybe Jesse can assign you there. Ollie is going to, um, uh, I'll say that in a minute. Ollie is going to um, manage the, the breakout room on churches. So do join Ollie in the church breakout room. Uh, Michael from Made Energy is going to manage a session on heat. So you can join Michael if you want to learn more about heat. Esme from Community Energy South is going to have a session on village halls and what you might, if you've got things you want to do with village halls. And we have John Hubbard from Energy Alton who is running a session on energy saving. Um, so it's really just a question and answer. It's just a session where you can go into breakout rooms, have a chat uh, with people who've got a lot more experience and, and, you know, other people in the session and hopefully something useful will come of it. Uh, yes, yes, thank you, Sue. I have also made a session for you, John Hubbard. Oh, no, no, not for you, John Hubbard. I've also made a session for uh, Patrick Culligan in case there are people who have further questions they'd like to ask to, to Patrick. So um, I'm going to, if you can't assign yourself to the breakout room you want to go to, just unmute yourself and let me know. Uh, How long have we got, Liz? We've got, what, 20 what, minutes in the breakout yeah, you've room? Yeah, we've got till five to two, and then we're going to reconvene at five to two and just close. Uh, can, I just, can I just remind all of the facilitators to press record on, on Zoom so that anyone uh, who wants to catch up on the other rooms can look on our YouTube afterwards. Thank you. Right, so I'm going to assign some people. And if you need assigning because you can't assign yourself, just open, uh, unmute yourself and let me know. Uh, I need uh, Ollie. Do you need to be assigned? No, I've worked it out. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Esme's joined. John Hubbard has joined his. Great. Uh, Chris has joined his. <coughs> yeah. Thank you, Jesse. Right. So the people who are still sitting here, it might be that you. Um, don't know how to assign yourself, or maybe you just are a bit tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or maybe you're, you're just, uh, you know, a little bit remote now. Uh, but I'll, um, 
So, Cathy, I can see you there. Would you like to join the heat session and would you like me to allocate you there? I'm not sure. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, not <clears throat> Nigel's had to go. Yeah. Um, well, I'll let you think while I ask other people who are still here if they need help. So, uh, Richard Ellis, do you need to be allocated somewhere? Yeah. Or chilly? I didn't know you could allocate yourself to uh, a room. How do you do that then? Uh, oh gosh, because I can, I, do you know what? I can't tell you, but oh, I right. can find you. I can't tell you because I, I see a different, different thing from what you see. Oh, okay. It's probably on more, but uh, if you tell me where you want to go, I can send you there. Uh, so what, what, are the, um, what are the options? Schools, there? churches, heat, village halls, energy saving, or your fun Surrey. I think the, um, the schools and churches, Okay, I'll send you to schools. You can always come back yep. and tell me you want to go to churches. Uh, right, and yeah, Sue, would you like me to assign, would, you should, any minute now, I imagine Richard's going to disappear. Sue, would you like me to send you anywhere? Yes, can I go to John Hubbard? Yes, yeah, of course. Thanks so much. Okay, right. Um, Diana Jones, would you like me to send you anywhere? No, okay. Uh, Swapna, would you like me to send you anywhere? It's a bit difficult when the video is She's... No, she's not joined. Um, okay. Right, so let's ask these other people there. They may just have, you know, be having lunch. Um, Dick Thomas, do you want me to send you anywhere? No, it's okay. I'm, I'm just, uh, just trying to decide at the moment. Oh, okay, lovely, thank you. And Sheila Goldsmith, do you need help? You seem to be here twice, which is very clever of you. I imagine you might be in a phone or something, or, or you know. <clears throat> no, okay, let's see if Sheila's said anything. Right. Now, you and I can nip in and out of the different rooms. Hmm. But I'm gonna switch my video and have my lunch. Someone else, Drew. Is it nice what you're eating? <laughs> I was so hungry. <laughs> you're a busy person. <laughs> um, we're supposed to be just wrapping up, wrapping up but I wonder if, um, I'm only you can't have more than one minute each, but if each chair would just feed back in less than a minute how the session was, and then we can say our goodbyes. Um, so I'll start with uh, whoever I can see. Should we start with John Hubbard? Okay, uh, I think our focus really was on a small group starting up. What's the thing? What's the best thing to do in terms of uh, how to get people involved? And given the needs uh, with high fuel prices etc what's best to do uh, and we talked through that and I think that would be a good um, subject for CES to give a, a bit of a, um, a template that would be useful I think for many groups to look at. Thank you, thank you very much I'll note, make a note of that, thank you John. Esme. Hi everybody, so very small group and we talked about in terms of village halls we talked about things to um, look out for so and things to uh, plan for so who owns the village hall is it a parish council or is it another uh, SME for example so that will direct you on where you get funding um, how energy efficient is it if you've got an EPC um, rated below D then really think about improving the energy efficiency before you do anything else um, there may be planning issues with older buildings some of them are listed um, if you're looking to install solar, we talked about uh, what is a suitable roof, uh, ideally aim for a south facing roof or east and west, um, uh, installing on roofs and shading and um, looking out for things like tiny little clay tiles that make it more expensive. Um, so a quick run through roofs and solar and where to start on village halls. Thank you. Uh, Michael Bevan, can I hand over to you now? Yeah, another small group, all three of us. Um, 
so I mean, I think the uh, consent, well, basically, heat, you can't need to concentrate on off-gas properties effectively. Um, the, the biomass is quite complicated um, and the heat networks are complicated, but um, may, maybe air source heat, heat pumps on uh, combined with solar and insulation on, on off-gas is actually is doable. And probably the best thing to do is just get on and do it. Great, thank you, Michael. Chris? Um, uh, a small group of four of us. Uh, we talked about King's Academy Ring Mirrors being a Ashton Award winner, which was a very good example of what schools can achieve. Uh, we talked about the differences between local authorities, uh, diocese of Chichester, Catholic schools, uh, academies, trusts, leases and licenses, and then talked a bit about products um, like uh, the Bowder roof system, um, the solar edge, uh, different, you know, looking out for things on flat roofs and how long um, the roof has been there and opportunities when a roof is going to be replaced and scaffolding going up and a new roof membrane going on. Perhaps that's a good chance to install solar and aggregating projects, because if you're going to do this as one off project and lots of volunteers are going to look after it for the next 20 years, or are you going to actually employ someone to look after these and aggregate uh, 20, 30 projects or whatever it takes to make that work? Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And finally, last but not at all least, of course, Ollie. Wonderful. Um, so I was on the churches group with, um, so just a small group of four of us, but very focused. And um, so thank you very much, Grace and Cawther. So um, yeah, we had a there's, we've realized that there is a um, the Diocese of Guildford have got quite a strong group and we know them all between us. And um, so we're gonna approach them. Uh, Grace was from Churches Together in Surrey, which was really useful. And Cawther, sorry, Cawther, I didn't quite check, but from the Muslim community and, and wider, you'd work for the diocese as well. So I think what we're gonna do, we're gonna follow up with each other and see if we can join a um, uh, the Diocese of Chichester Green Group and look at options and see if we can find out where there are churches that are on oil and where they need support and maybe link them back to the Surrey Fund and obviously to community energy groups. Lovely, that sounds great. Well, uh, thank you very much everyone. We've come to the end of quite a marathon session. Uh, so for those of you who stayed the course, really well done. And I hope you'll take away lots of useful and inspiring um, ideas of ways forward. Uh, for our speakers, thank you so much for your time and what you've contributed, because I know you put in the time before you came along to put together presentations too. So, so thank you so much for that. Um, now, I just want to check, check if Esme or Ollie would like to say anything. And um, I just want to say a big thank you. And just to say, what a fantastic session. Well done, everybody that spoke and really great connecting with you all. And we're looking forward to, to offering you more support in Surrey. So keep in touch and take yeah, on the keep, mentoring. Keep in touch. All groups can then um, come back to um, Esme, myself, Liz and Jesse and the team and Nicola and Michael and um, for more mentoring going forward. And that's the mission to set up a network of community energy groups in Surrey um, that we can all work together and be a lot stronger together. So thank you very much. And huge thank you to Liz as our master of ceremonies. Um, there's a lot of moving around that you do. So thank you very much, Liz. We're all hugely grateful for that. that thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. And to all the Surrey team as well. Thank you. Thank you On behalf of all. Bye. 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 Have a great afternoon, Bye. everyone. Okay.